Good evening. I'm calling to order the regular meeting of the Arlington School Committee on Thursday, December 15th, 2022. I'm Liz Exton, the chair. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Dr. Allison Ampey? Here. All right, so everyone else is in person. Tonight's meeting of the Arlington School Committee is being conducted in a hybrid model. Before we begin, permit me to offer a few notes. First, this meeting is being conducted via Zoom, is being recorded, and is also being simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that they may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, you are asked to provide your full name in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. All participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials also found on the town's website using the Novus Agenda platform. And finally, each vote tonight will be taken by roll call. Our first agenda item this evening is the Performing Arts um, Program is going to give us a brief mu musical performance. Welcome and thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. 
All right. The next item on our agenda is public comment. <clears throat> Before we call our first speaker, I have a few ground rules. For members of the public who wish to address the committee, there will be 20 minutes of public comment. Depending on the number of people who sign up, time allotments may be reduced but will not exceed three minutes each. I will let the speakers know when they have 30 seconds left. If the number of people who sign up exceeds what can be done in 20 minutes, the number of speakers may be capped and will be invited to speak based on the timestamp of their email to Ms. Diggins. The school committee respectfully requests participants of the public to utilize their camera if possible while speaking and to adhere to the public comment policy BEDH that requires participants to provide their name and address. Speakers may offer such objective criticisms of the school operations and programs as concern them, but in public session, the committee will not hear personal complaints about school personnel nor against any member of the school community, except for the school committee or the superintendent in their capacity as the operational leader of Arlington Public Schools. The public is reminded that the school committee does not hold jurisdiction over the performance of school personnel other than the superintendent. Additionally, the committee will not hear anything that might identify and or infringe upon a student's privacy by name or incident. If you would like to sign up to speak, please email ediggins at arlington.k12.ma.us by 3 p.m. on the date of the meeting. We have one person signed up for public comment. Michael Crosby is on Zoom, I believe. Yes, Mr. Crosby, you have three minutes. Go ahead. All right. Well, first, um, thank you for having me. I'm oh. kind of new to this. Can we make, hold? Can you wait just a second? We need to make the volume louder. I can adjust it on my end oh. too. Is that better? Uh, hold, hold on one second. Try again. Just say hello. Yes, thing. Yeah. Here. That's better. Sure. Thank gotcha. you. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Um. My reason for wanting to join this is because I've been undergoing some difficult um, back and forth with the superintendent's office. I uh, recently underwent a divorce. I have three children that attend the Arlington Public Schools, two of which have been unschooled, which is a term that is new to the uh, school committee, apparently. It is not homeschooled, it is where the parent provides a fabricated um, agenda for the student's education that isn't actually taking place. And they don't actually attend the school, they don't attend the hours. Um, but prior to that, my son, which I will not state his name, but you know, for privacy, um, last year, he had missed over 70 days of school, 70 absences. And his grade point average, I don't know, you know, wasn't, wasn't the worst, but it wasn't the best. He had, a, you, know, you know, according to his transcript, student did not attend a single class in Q4. Student attendance was very limited in Q4. But yet they allowed him to, to be promoted to the next grade, which was concerning to me. And in, in, in the middle of going through a divorce where there's already high tensions and my concern is for my children's well-being and he had aspirations of going to Minuteman Tech um, because you know he's interested in um, automotive and welding and such. Um, but right now, He's involved in a program that's known as Pathfinder Learning Centers, which is not accredited, that not licensed by the, the Arlington uh, uh, Small Business Association, and not accredited by anybody. They're just a, a woman who had an idea during COVID. She started as a cook, Julia Cooks. And uh, she operates out of the church on the corner of Mass Ave and what is it, Linwood, the one that goes down to the spy pond. They have four days a week. I have, I have and I've been speaking to uh, Cindy Sheridan Curran quite frequently about this uh, because by the Arlington Mr. bylaws- Mr. Crosby, you have, you have 30 seconds left. Okay, by the Arlington bylaws, it states that if you have probable cause that the educational program that was submitted as a homeschooling program did not meet the criteria for the child's betterment. My son is also considered um, to have um, 
uh, special needs and he's in the IEP program, which they removed him from an IEP. Mr. To... Cosby, your, your three minutes are finished and you're starting to push the well, that limits that of wasn't identifying people. I mean, I have the timer on, but that wasn't 30 seconds. But I'm just curious how this can happen. And this isn't going to stop here because when people realize that they could just remove their children from school, and that the school committee and, and Dr. Roderick McNeil is not going to reply to your emails. As Mr. You Crosby, you, you cannot name people other than the superintendent and the school committee, and your time oh, I'm is sorry. up. Yeah, Please I wrap He's up. The I, for, I apologize. I forgot he was the assistant superintendent. But I'm just looking for an answer as to how this could happen. And I, and I don't get it. I don't get the answer. Nobody is willing to give the answer. This, this education is not happening. As far as, you know, Obama's plan with nobody left behind, no student left behind, and then the, the subsequent renaming of it. My son is 14. Mr. Crosby, I'm gonna ask you to stop now. Your time is up and you're um, providing more identifying information about your family. Thank you for your comments. The committee has heard you. Identifying information about my family that he wanted to go to Minuteman? His age, his current school. His Thank current you. school didn't no. go to school. Mr. Crosby, your time is finished. Thank you. So what now? We move on to our next agenda item. So you don't comment on anything I said that just is, nope. as if it happened? Um, the next item on our agenda is student representatives uh, to the school you can committee. You read about it on Channel 5. Um, but they are not here. They must be at sports or... <laughs> performances or playing the violin. Right <laughs> um, so our next item on the agenda is the school committee appointment to the Arlington Human Rights Commission. Um, Lori <coughs> Key is here if you don't mind um, stepping up to the table um, and you'll want to make sure you're talking into that microphone please. Uh, Lori Key has um, come to the school committee on the recommendation of the community relations subcommittee to be appointed to the Arlington Human Rights Commission. Welcome, thank you for coming. Thank if you. you can just share a, a few words about who you are and why you're interested in being on the Arlington Human Rights Commission. And Yes, so I'm Lori Key um, and I am um, applying for the commissioner position. And I believe I can contribute to the commission due to my passion for equity and human rights, which has been the foundation of my work as a social worker for over 20 years. I've worked in Arlington for much of my career, starting as a residential <coughs> counselor at Jermaine Lawrence uh, before and through graduate school and as a social work intern at the Dallin School. After working as an intensive home-based family therapist in Boston and as a social worker in the Boston and Randolph Public Schools, I returned to work in Arlington at Arlington High through the Brighton Alston Mental Health Clinic. I was then hired at Audison in 2008, where I worked up until a year ago with my last three plus years as lead counselor. Wanting to do more work directly in the area of equity and human rights, I've been consistently attending the Arlington Diversity Task Group and the Arlington Human Rights Commission meetings for the past eight months. I joined the Arlington Human Rights Commission events and outreach working group I'm currently helping to plan an event we hope to hold here in March at Arlington High for community members to examine the impact of words, actions, and microaggressions, and to discuss how we can work together to make Arlington an even more supportive community for all. I would now like to take on an even more active role with the Human Rights Commission as a commissioner. Part of the role involves addressing human rights complaints made to the commission, and in my role as school counselor in Arlington for many years, I'm knowledgeable about the school department's policies and procedures with these types of issues. And when appropriate, when appropriate, I frequently run mediations between students, between students and staff to help address these issues. So I hope to bring these skills along with my passion for equity and human rights to the commission. So thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Mr. Hainer. I move that uh, Lori Key be appointed to the Arlington Human Rights Commission as representative of the Arlington School Committee. Second. Thank you. We have a motion by Mr. Hainer, seconded by Mr. Thielman. Any discussion? All right. Roll call vote. Mr. Hainer? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Dr. Alice Anampi? Yes. 
and I vote yes. That's unanimous. Congratulations, and thank you very much. That was easy. <laughs> thank you for serving. All right, next we have our performing arts report. This way and her. So you'll just want to make sure if you're the person speaking that you're speaking into the microphone, whoever's. Roll that in. Yep, you well, move chairs up to the, move the chairs, yep. I would feel very lonely, come on. <laughs> <laughs> we have a whole team here. Okay. Good evening. Thank you for having me here. The Performing Arts Department serves Arlington Public students K-12 with education on general music, instrumental music, choral music, music technology, and theater. Today, our agenda, well, first you have heard our opening music. Um, I'm very proud to bring this group of young musicians with me. Um, we have violin Shilu, Asra, Kanan, Ingrid, and I play the viola, which is larger than violin. And then uh, we have Lorenzo Hamlin on cello and Mr. Michael Simon on bass. And the piece is really meaningful to me because I actually, we, I let my string team did a, a PD presentation on Florence Price's piece on November 8th. And I felt the mission should continue to promote music, musician composers, uh, marginalized musician composers. So we'll try our best to play more of her music. Our next agenda is going to be, I'm going to talk about our mission statement a little bit. So our mission statement focuses on educating all students in music and theater arts and making a commitment to provide a safe, encouraging, and engaging learning environment for all students. After Arlington Public Schools established the new vision statement, we continue to further align our mission with the APS vision statement by achieving a joyful learning environment, making sure students have a sense of belonging in our programs, and empowering all our students to contribute their artistic vision to the local and global communities. Today, I'm gonna share with you the highlights of the programs, the wings. <laughs> so, first of all, I'd like to thank you all, school committee members and administrators, for your unprecedented work and support to eliminate the fees for students to participate in the in-school instrumental classes. This incredible measure encouraged and allowed many more students to join this program. So let's take a look at the instrumental enrollment. Now on this slide, you can see a chart of grade four to 12 band program, which you can also see how many instruments we are offering in school, woodwind instruments, brass instruments, and percussion instruments. So the elementary uh, band program went from 170 students to 276 students this year. And total of the band program students are 433 from, all, from grade four to 12. Next slide. So on this slide, you can see the enrollment for grade three to 12 string students. So last year, elementary string program had 315 students. And this year we got 478 students enrolled in the stream program. Overall, we actually have 754 elementary band and orchestra students compared to 485 students last year. So after adding all the numbers, you can, we, I am very proud to offer you a number. <laughs> it's all about data, right? We have 1,112 instrumental students playing our band and orchestra program. And that's from grade three to 12. So with the growth, oh, actually I want to offer you a fun fact because I have a choral directors here. We also have almost 600 students singing in the course. And I'll focus on that more in my next meet, uh, presentation. <laughs> with the growth in the elementary instrumental program, we needed to have two teams of instructors to teach lessons. The lessons are taught homogeneously, such as brass instruments together, wooing class, and percussion class, and string class. And the lessons are also taught during teachers' 
classroom teachers come at meeting time, which means the students are not missing core subject instruction. So here you can see the uh, chart of our wonderful instrumental teachers. Next, thank you. We all know the home practice and family engagement plays a very important role and contribute to the success of learning. So therefore, some high school students and I started a practice buddy program this year. The students who performed with me, with me today are all practice buddies. And I would like to invite our student leader, Xu Lu Wen, to introduce you. So I was over in COVID thinking about how, what can I do for my community? And the idea for this program started in the beginning of COVID. Many of students have helped with younger students previously with setting up playing with the elementary school orchestras and cleaning up in preparation for our annual all town concerts. Like our amazing string staff, I wanted a way to give back to my community that heavily influenced my love for playing violin. <coughs> so I brought the idea of practice buddies up to our now director of performing arts, Miss Wei. Miss Wei was very supportive of this idea and thought it was a good way for students to personalize the learning for each individual student. So the two of us got to working and organizing over the summer. With the help of our amazing practice buddies, we made this idea possible with the program first running on November 14, 2022. Since the high schooler practice buddies are right now rehearsing for our up and coming winter concert, we have some eighth grader practice buddies here. You can learn more about each student and what they think about practice buddies on our website. Since I have a rehearsal that I should probably be in, I am going to hand the mic over to Azra, a representative of the eighth grader practice buddies. Um, so, hello, my name is Azra. Thank you very much. Bye. <laughs> um, my name is Astra. I came to Arlington from Iran when I was in the fifth grade, and I always wanted to play the violin and was so glad to join the APS string program. A few eighth graders, including myself, really admired the Practice Buddies idea and asked to be part of this program. We hope to continue and run this program when we come to the high school next year. This program benefits both us and the young students. It helps us, the tutors, to learn how to teach and how to connect with different students and different levels of playing. The students learn more about their instruments and we also help them review and go over what they learned from their string classes and help parents to understand how to assist their children to practice at home. This program also helps new talent to be discovered and it's generally a great way for students to learn and to ask any, uh, um, ask any questions they might have and yeah, it's really great. People also have been very supportive of this and as of now we have 18 tutors and 106 elementary school students participating in the program. And one more uh, effort we're doing to uh, further enhance our family engagement is we, are, we will be distributing progress report for all uh, instrumental students. So family will understand students learning with detailed report card. And I'm inviting our new grade three to eight orchestra director, Mr. Simon here to talk briefly about this. Good evening, uh, I'll be really quick. Um, so, uh, as in with many facets of our students' education, uh, one of the most important goals for the elementary string program is to uh, make sure that we're not only providing parents with consistent and clear communication, but also educating uh, our parents, our young musicians' parents, um, uh, with the sense of promoting um, their growth and success outside of our classes, uh, in addition to in our classes, of course. Um, so many of the students, similar to my own, uh, uh, growing up as a musician, uh, come from homes that uh, have parents that are non-musicians or parents or family members who have never played an instrument before. So many of them uh, truly just uh, don't understand exactly what they're doing in school. Um, so the progress reports are really uh, have those two things in mind. So educating our parents and also providing uh, um, you know, a clear and consistent message to them about what we're doing in our classes. Um, so last year we piloted this program with just third graders. Uh, the, so the string team uh, worked many hours to develop these progress reports um, that are consistent with what uh, our students are regularly getting from their core classes. Um, we worked uh, directly with um, Dr. McNeil's uh, office to make sure that our, our uh, language was clear 
uh, easy to follow. It didn't have too much musical jargon within it uh, so that our parents can understand. Um, so we piloted it. Uh, we took a survey after, and we got an overwhelming positive response from our families and from our students. And so this year, our mission, as, as um, Ms. Jingwei mentioned, uh, we have uh, nearly 800 students. Uh, and so our goal is to provide all of those students with a progress report to a mid-year and an end of year um, that will have an accompanying rubric that will outline everything within that progress report um, with the hope to not only uh, keep those students with us for many years to come, uh, but also to, again, help promote that uh, communication with our parents. Yeah. All right, everybody starts as a beginner. So I do, I made a video for three minutes. I don't know if we ever really have time for that, for that to, have, to give you a virtual tour to our beginner elementary classroom. We're gonna hope that this works. You may want to hit play again. Mm -hmm. The audio. Yeah, I can't turn audio on my computer. Down at the bottom. On the bottom, no. Right, but I can't turn the audio on my computer. Oh. Because it'll feedback. Visual is still awesome. Yeah. <laughs> right, we were gonna I, I can sing it. Watch it. What they were doing. Dun da 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 is it? I don't know. It's only the summer. Seriously, that's so. Our teachers actually use very interesting, engaging songs for them to learn open strings. So we, like, for example, the first part of it is actually an and song. We sing and and and. Begin to the der der der. So with a D, all the way to ground ground ground. Can't All the way to China, China, China. <laughs> so we make up funny songs for them to yeah. remember the name of the open streams. And then rest of the video, when you have a chance, I really encourage you to watch it because it's really fun to watch the trumpet players try to honk out the sound. I often say, when I enter the classroom, I'll say, Happy New Year. <laughs> so that's what it sounds like. But without this groundwork, it would not be able, we'd not be able to have such a wonderful, like the musicians I brought today. Okay, so next part. Next program highlights I want to focus is on music technology. We're in the digital age, and music technology has become the new means of making music and communication on music. Multi-tools and function on music technology have provided our world with many possibilities. This past years of COVID certainly pushed the music technology into our music classroom, starting at elementary level. So I have a video made by our beloved Thompson School <laughs> music teacher here. So I, I'm not sure if the sound will work. So in this video, he introduced how the students use a Chrome Music Lab. They have all kinds of different sound files, uh, rhythm files, and they can put together a composed music by their, themselves. <laughs> here, Dario, yay, hi. You're yeah. not gonna be able to hear. Yeah, we won't be over here. You can only watch. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, so you can see, so this, I'm going to explain. So um, every student at elementary school has this uh, Chromebook on their Chromebook. They have all the apps and then through Clever, and they can actually use, for example, this is, that's like the um, music app they can use, like what I described earlier, the rhythm, the tune, and the beats, and they can do different track. Here, Darius are talking about kids are learning different sound wave. If this is such a tight right into our fixes, early fixes uh, concept. And then here, the Chrome Music Lab, they, those are tunes and they can pile those uh, beautiful, <clears throat> colorful dots together to make their own music. And this is a, their uh, Quaver Music, which is a new, a very big part of our music education now. So we, because during COVID, we um, incorporate this Quaver ed education music. Um, technology into our classrooms so students can continue to learn their the, the learn the uh, B and art and artful ideas and also concept of music and this is another another in, um, incredible box many teenagers love this too they all have this on their app okay so we'll guess we'll just we'll move forward so the middle school level we use something called soundtrack so today I have mr. Smith from Addison to talk about soundtrack 
Hi. Um, I'm Nathaniel Smith. I teach at the Audison. Um, uh, we use Soundtrap a lot. It is a software where we get to record, the kids get to record the things we work on in class. So whenever we learn like different songs, we have them record it, and then they can listen back to it and modify and work on it, whether it be using the auto-tune function or adding in tracks like on their 12, we have also different projects we do. So like our 12-bar blues project, we have the kids add in like tracks. They can add in like beats to it. They can move around voices. So like say uh, one kid made a track where they were like, I want to move the lyric over here. They could like slide their lyric to the other side and move the other kid's lyric to the front of it. Um, we also, in the eighth grade, we do a scene project where the kids create their own song. So then they get to add, use the tracks from the, um, from Soundtrap and create like different songs, like create things to add to their song. They use the 12 bar blues <coughs> with the ukulele, all the instruments we use get put onto Soundtrap. It also makes it easier for grading and able to understand where their progress is on the instruments. Because as a group, you know, everyone's playing together, but it's nice and easier and less stressful for the kids to like, be like, oh, you know, right here you could just play this like this. And they're like, oh, okay. And they just go back and record. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Smith. High school level, we have a new performing art wing. We have a really nice music tech lab, which offers students more opportunities to discover the world of music technology. Mr. Dita Marcel here is going to introduce some of the music technology programs we have at high school. Thank you. So I do want to thank everybody for the beautiful uh, facility that we have now. It is loaded with potential into the next century for, I think, a level of learning in music and music production that is relatively unheard of in the area if we are able to maximize it, and I think we can together. Uh, the program, to back up very quickly, started in 2008 uh, with some grant money, some seed money that allowed us to buy us some workstations in the old building, and we quickly um, started making original music. It is a student-centered class, so we, um, we will create our own music for the concert uh, rather than me presenting them with music and us learning it. In order to be able to do this, as Ms. Wei had uh, clearly demonstrated, <laughs> you know, we have to have a similar kind of uh, K through 12 version of music technology that feeds into a student's ability to imagine and realize music uh, of their own. Uh, and that involves, and it is hand in hand with our, with our uh, great ensemble programs, but this affords access to music to people who would otherwise not have it, who are not going to be a member of an orchestra or looking to play an instrument uh, or perhaps sing, but rather create, produce, record, and all of these aspects are really how we experience music. Anytime that we uh, are listening to an orchestra or our favorite artists, those things are recorded in the studio. And as you know, there are wonderful programs here in the Boston area um, that are open to these students when they go onward um, into college. And to prepare them for it better here, I think we have a chance to really get a leg up on other students here in Arlington. Uh, compared to any place else in the state, or perhaps most places in the country. So we have a, a facility that is interconnected now. Uh, all of our rehearsal spaces and all of our practice rooms can all be recorded from the studio. So virtually speaking, the music studio now expands to the entire wing that we have built, which is a beautiful idea. And in the real world, that's how it would be done with folks recording in different places. This is a level of learning that would not have been possible in the old building. Um, and it was very wise of us to take that step. It was relatively not a, a, an expensive thing to do. It's just a, a parallel network is really what we've done and some connectors. Uh, <coughs> and so because it's virtual, we never have to buy more cables for it. We never have to do any of that kind of stuff. But what we do need to do is, is, is raise it up to the level where the students can maximize it. So our design or our plan over the next year um, before we open up the facility to the public, perhaps, uh, would be to have student-led teams and teams of, of our instructors also helping uh, with this facility, not just me, 
um, so that we have an adult presence and uh, upperclassmen showing underclassmen how the whole idea of production works in a studio and in a live performance. Um, our programs that we're currently using, Band in a Box uh, is a composition program, generates uh, backing tracks based on chords that students come up with. They can mix and match things, pull things out, and then analyze it. So it's a generative tool. Um, it allows us to fill in the gaps between our broad stroke ideas and generate something that is a really amazing professional piece of music. Uh, our Reaper uh, license that you guys have continued to support for us, we only need that usually every five years, uh, is a professional level DAW or digital audio workstation. Um, and this connects to Soundtrap in the middle school and elementary school levels, which is kind of an introductory version of that. So it's because of COVID, we now have kind of a feeder program up to this production level. Uh, students doing multi-track layer cakes of sound and balancing them and learning to listen and make those adjustments, be critical listeners. Um, and MuseScore, a traditional composition tool, notation generated uh, for parts, for our students who are not orchestra players to hand to orchestra players to perform. And we do one of those concerts every year, one in March. And we do the same thing with the, the choral groups so that the, the in music technology students are not unaware of choral repertoire or band repertoire or um, the great history of orchestral repertoire that we have. Again, probably not going to be able to hear this. I do encourage you to um, check this out, and I can share it out to everybody to watch at their own time. Um, but I did want to point out the wonderful students that created this. Um, currently a sophomore, uh, Mazen Abukala, uh, found his voice in our music intro to music technology, and particularly in the film scoring units. And now he's one of the film scoring students, which is um, one of our semesterized courses that we take. So our curriculum starts with music technology, and then it goes on uh, for the rest of the four years where they can choose one or two compatible semesterized courses like film scoring and songwriting, or mixing and mastering and sound design. And then portfolio one and two for their senior year uh, where they can prepare for entering into a, uh, a college or perhaps the workforce, uh, going in to get a job in a studio, um, or to get into a, a program like at Berkeley where we have the uh, music engineering program, for example, or at UMass Lowell or any of the uh, fantastic schools that we have in New England for that. Thank you. So we all know. Uh, Miss Way, Miss Way, sorry, just, you have about three more minutes left. Okay, excellent. Yeah, we will do it in three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and so we all know that without the real foundation work, students will not be able to achieve a higher level of performances. And so the, we, the tuneful idea, the beatful or the artful work really starts with our young student, the youngest student in kindergarten. So I'm going to invite Ms. Murray to just talk quickly, give us a quick overview on what we, we have in K-5 curriculum. Thank you. Hi, I'm Megan. I teach music at the Bracket. Um, and I really love my job. <laughs> Just fantastic. Um, so as Ms. Wei said, we start with kindergarten teaching tuneful, beatful, artful. What does that mean, you say? Great question. Have you been in a restaurant and heard people attempting to sing happy birthday? <laughs> right, so when you have a tuneful voice, you are able to sing happy birthday in a way that doesn't make the people around you cry. And when you're able to be beatful, it means you can dance at a wedding, whether it's your own wedding or your children's wedding or your green at Matilda. And when you are artful, you are able to participate and be in music in a way that is emotional and enjoyable and artistic. And we start that curriculum in kindergarten. Um, over the course of our six years with the elementary students, we do an awful lot. Um, starting in the second and third grade, um, we're uh, introducing more traditional Western classical music notation. In the third grade, we start recorders as a preparatory program for the woodwind, brass, and percussion program that will eventually lead them to band. Starting in the um, fifth grade, we're now offering a ukulele program. <laughs> Two things that I want to highlight for you specifically is that this is the first year that we have building-based elementary school choruses, which are open to fourth and fifth graders. Um, 
choir is my team sport, so this is, it's just something that is bringing me so much joy and being able to sing and make music in community every week in an intentional and opt-in way is such a beautiful opportunity for our students. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to highlight for you is a new curriculum that we have pilot piloted called Musician of the Month, um, which is a curriculum that strives to be actively anti-racist <coughs> in which our students are exposed to musicians who reflect their own identities. And so over the course of a school year, um, we select one musician every month and we seek diversity in a variety of categories, including gender identity, age, cultural background, um, whether or not they're alive, which I guess is also age, um, <laughs> <laughs> musical genre, um, and where they're physically from in the world. So we're really proud of what we're doing and we are so grateful to be able to provide this foundational experience for our students. Thank you. My closing. I would like to share a quote from Leonard Bernstein, music and name the unnameable and communicate the unknowable. So during one of the practice body session, one of the parents came up to me and said, every time I, co I come here, I hear something amazing from the performing art wing. And it really makes me very happy. And personally, I really want to say, I have countless moments of joy but by listening to our young musicians. So it takes time, it practice after practice to build out skills and techniques for performances. In addition, it takes a lot of courage and confidence to perform in front of an audience. The Performing Art Program de Department strives to provide students with skills and empower them to share their achievement with their communities. So we are doing that. Our students have been performing for our community. Actually, we just did a Remembrance, remembrance Climate Change Future, in which a really successful event, our honest orchestra performed that. And Arlington First Light Candlelight, and this upcoming week, students will be performing at Housing Authority Dinner. And in January, performing our teams and students will be performing at the Martin Luther King uh, Celebration. I do want to highlight one upcoming APS community event is our our first ever Theater for the Young Audience program is going to be, 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 be pr pr presented. So our high school theater director, Michael Byrne, was awarded an EF grant to provide the opportunity for elementary students to come to the new building, new auditorium to watch a children's musical, uh, Straganona, in the spring. So I hope you enjoy our presentation today. I was gonna leave you with a really nice recording that you didn't get to hear because you were here on December 1st. I went to the first slide, recorded the student performing. So at your time, please enjoy their performance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions or comments from the committee? Mr. Cardin. Um, so just, just one comment. So last year when we approved the elimination of the instrumental music fees, I don't think we thought about, we didn't hear about the possibility or the likelihood we should have thought about it, that demand would go way through the roof. Um, so I, we've seen the budget request for next year and we'll have to sort of sort through that, but it sort of was an unexpected cost. So that's just more of a comment. And my question is, so at, at Audison, in the seventh grade for math, we're looking at whether that's really the right age to separate students into advanced math and regular math. I wonder if through a similar equity lens, you've thought about looking at whether the Audison is the right place to start separating students into audition-based band and chorus and not audition-based band and chorus? So we currently already have that. So um, the seventh grade, eighth grade band and orchestra practice together, but we do have an after-school after ensemble that's by audition only. So there's a jazz band, uh, seventh, eighth grade jazz band by audition, and seventh, eighth grade chamber orchestra by audition only. Yeah, but we, I, one of our department's uh, policy is all students in honors groups need to be part of the large group because they bring up the, the, the it's part of the leadership uh, concept for them to be part of big community. Thanks. May I respond to something you said? Sure. Um, just in terms of the budget request, what a great problem to have. <laughs> <laughs> I am so proud to be part of a, pay to, a district that's no longer pay to play and thank you for your support. Anybody else? Dr. Allison Ampey. Thank you very much for the uh, presentation. I look forward to hearing the videos, but wonder if you could send out the links, because at least on my uh, PDF, it, the links didn't work. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so if we could just have an email with all the, the links so that we could see the actual videos and hear them too. Thank you. We'll do, we'll do. Mr. Schlickman. Um, that, <laughs> thank you for your presentation. I mean, the thing that we've noticed uh, all out, before we built the new high school, we had some of the best performing arts in the worst facility and I look so forward to seeing what kind of re really wonderful things you can do now that we've been able to find you uh, a space that is worthy and the acoustics are wonderful in the new auditorium um, and I, yeah yeah I want to add you know our joyful moments are now figuring out how to use acoustic panel uh -huh. the other day um, teachers and I we figured it out and turn on the light what a moment <laughs> Was it a matter of where you put the piano in, on the stage? We will figure it out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it's terrific, and I think I'm really heartened by the increased participation in the program. It shows that uh, we had students who, with their musical uh, life unfulfilled because we had that barrier, and uh, I, I think it's just joyous for us to be able to, to just open up the program. Um, and thank you for all the performances. I was here, uh, was it last Saturday or Saturday before for the uh, <clears throat> environmental program? And that little niche in there, right at the entrance to the auditorium, really makes some nice acoustics. Yes. We yeah. could do great things in that little lobby, too. Yes, we found a good lobby music place. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Awesome. Ms. Morgan. Um, this was great. I have two, just two quick things. Um, the first one, actually, I, I learned a lot from this presentation, um, one of which I'm going to take home because I've now learned why um, when my son told Ms. Demetrio that he was quitting oboe this year and focusing on saxophone and she said, no, sit down, um, I understand why, because you need people to play the oboe, so we'll have a conversation about that. Um, <laughs> tomorrow. Um, so I think, so one thing on the elementary music piece, for those of us, um, and, and Mr. DiTomaso can attest to this because he teaches my son, as parents who are helping our kids learn new instruments, we need so much help, right? And so anything that you can, because we want these, all of these kids who have started, we want them to persist, right? And we know there's going to be some attrition, but I know I played the violin and my sons have all taken up these brass instruments that I don't know how to use or play and it's like kind of stressful and, and I've sent Mr. I like send them screenshots and I'm like, this is what it looks like. Like, how do I fix this? You know, so I think anything that you can do to help us as parents, um, especially in grades three, four, and five, to, to get us connected to the right person who can tell us, like, like my, my fourth grader came home the other day and said, can Santa bring me a snake? for my trombone. <laughs> and I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Right? So like I Google it, like it all like worked out, but like, so we just, we need, we just need help. Um, Cause we want these kids to continue and it's, it can be stressful when you're looking at this instrument and you don't know what to do. The, the other piece that I hope, and it was great to hear about what you're doing at the Audison, um, I hope that as a department, you will continue to advocate strongly for choice for kids because we want them, we, we, there are times, like my kids, because they do band, they can't, they don't take music at Audison, right? And we wanna continue, and it, it becomes a problem at the high school too, right? You've gotta really commit to it if you wanna do it. And just, con and I know that there are lots of ways that you've been able to be flexible flexible and, and as a department, you're so strong. So as you continue to just let, give kids as many opportunities as they can to pick music, like even if it's for a semester, even if it's, you know, if, if there's some way that they can trade out one thing and, and get into that music class at the Audison, um, I, I think it's just, it's so important. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to sort of follow up um, on Ms. Morgan's comments, so my son has been participating in the um, Practice Buddies program and it has been a tremendous um, support to him and so perhaps moving forward it can be added some band instruments yes. as well. Um, that, that's my plan. That Come, would be, yes, we'll that be coming would help. soon. <laughs> yeah, um, and, I, and 
piggybacking on that piece of it, um, it has been such a nice opportunity for elementary school families to see this beautiful building and the performing arts wing and the practice rooms and all of the opportunities that the high school um, has to offer. So thank you very much for organizing that. I know it's a lot for you and your, your high school <laughs> um, peer, but um, yeah, it's made a tremendous difference. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you all very much. Yes, <coughs> Dr. Hellman. One last thing. The heart, soul, and time that Ms. Way and her team puts into their work is evident in what we saw this evening, um, in what you've shared um, about your programming today. And I just want to say thank you. We invested in many ways in the performing arts last year when we made this role full time. And your leadership has been very noticed, very impactful, very appreciated. Very nice job. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Can you. Can I just add one thing, Miss Way? You know what my wife does for a living? Yes. Yeah, pia uh, pianist. And you know what she does on Wednesdays and Sundays, right? Please lead your staff through the <laughs> break. Yeah, we will do. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Hey, high five. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Nice job. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> All right. Um, next, we have the Stratton School Improvement Plan. Dr. Hanna, Dr. <coughs> O'Brien, anybody else you mm -hmm. have with you? Mm -hmm. Where are you guys' instruments? <laughs> what are you going <laughs> to perform for us? Is this South <laughs> we did see where we were on the agenda. <laughs> it's a tough act to follow. <laughs> Quickly brainstorming something we could do with a slide deck. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, I will say that, that the partnership with Ms. Way as an uh, elementary building leader is fantastic. She's so thoughtful about you mm -hmm. know, her teachers coming in, their itinerant <clears throat> teachers all around the district, and it's been great working with her. Um, Michael Hanna, principal at Stratton School. Um, I want to reintroduce Dr. O'Brien, um, our assistant principal. We're just going to split up our presentation uh, in a moment, but before we get started, I just wanted to... Uh, thank the, the people who are with me every single day at Stratton School. The faculty and staff are, I'm sorry, Ms. Donato, the best in the world. Um, and uh, I just wanted to thank them for being a part of our growth. This is my 10th year leading the school. Um, we've uh, gone through leadership transition, a building project, a COVID crisis, and uh, they're just a remarkable group of people, and I want to thank them all here tonight uh, for working with me. Um, you see our agenda kind of breaks down into successes and challenges, uh, and then our priorities and initiatives. So uh, I'm just going to let Dr. O'Brien take that first part, and um, I'll jump in on the second. Absolutely. So I think everyone here is aware of the APS vision, so I won't read that to you, um, and our Stratton mission follows. But on the next slide, you will see our successes that we've had so far this year. Um, being new to not only Stratton but the Arlington community, I have already experienced so many different initiatives that have led to student learning, um, further student achievement. We've been holding weekly grade level PMD meetings and those have been going really well for us. During this time, our grade level teams have been reviewing data with our coaches. Our coaches have been modeling lessons for them to reflect on as teams. We've been monitoring and discussing student concerns, ongoing challenges classroom teachers might be having that they want to um, bounce ideas off of each other. And most recently, some of our grade level teams have even created learning kits to share and use during their small group times. We've also been deepening our culture of coaching and professional learning through our learning walks. And our MCAS scores are a reflection of the work that we're doing. So last year, our fifth grade students actually scored the highest out of all the elementary schools in math and ELA. Sorry again. <laughs> <laughs> um, and along the same lines, we've seen an increase in early reading and writing achievement. So in addition to all the learning and the growing that students are doing, we are absolutely thrilled to have our new playground done. Students are so excited and it's great to see them out there. We're really grateful to have that um, at our school and have that completed. Last year, in the last full staff administration of the Panorama Survey, we saw scores above the district average for learning models, staff relationships, and well-being. We have also had a great time creating a partnership and working with Jean Thompson Grove. If you don't know her, she is a fantastic person to consult with. She has a lot of great ideas, and she's been a really knowledgeable and collaborative partner in designing meaningful professional learning opportunities with us. 
that are really increasing our sense of belonging among our staff. So the work that we've been doing, on the next slide, you'll see some of our challenges. Um, with Jean brings me to our first challenge as a school. So based on that same panorama survey, an area of relative weakness for us is our cultural awareness and action. So in response to this, and in addition to the consulting that we've been doing with Jean, we're anchoring our faculty meetings and leadership meetings around this to cultivate a stronger sense of belonging, not only just for our faculty and staff, but our entire Stratton community. Another challenge that we've had this year is the elimination of our point four reading specialist, and this has really accelerated our urgency to address our more mid-level <coughs> struggling readers and their need for targeted reading, targeted reading intervention in their general education classroom. So these challenges have led us to our goals that you're going to hear about today, and I'll let Dr. Hannah speak to those. But I did just wanna say it's been really clear to me in the short time that I've spent here at Stratton and the Arlington community that we have a really strong foundation of our strengths um, to really go forward with and build on. So you'll see a, a connection uh, to the, uh, the district vision and, and strategic initiatives in all three of the Stratton goals for, for next year. Um, as a uh, sort of deliverable or as, a, as a, an output of our focus on cultural awareness and action, uh, we intend to score higher on the on favorable responses uh, on the panorama survey in our spring 23 administration. Um, the instructional leadership team initiative that uh, Dr. Homa and Dr. McNeil have been leading is fundamental to our ability to do this. Um, we have very deliberately teased apart the instructional leadership team from an operations leadership team. They meet separately, they're separate members, and the former is focused very tightly on uh, this kind of work. Um, so I, I thank uh, the um, superintendents for their uh, support of that structure. Uh, our work will be really twofold. There is, of course, <clears throat> a, uh, a great opportunity to work with our uh, Stratton Dig group and and uh, the uh, chair of that group and I are working closely together to develop grade level uh, representatives, uh, parent representatives, uh, to connect with faculty around curriculum, um, the scope and sequence and where there'd be some good spots to land for this work and to connect with the families who are in that grade level to be a part of those um, learning, learning times. Uh, you see some other ways that we feel uh, we will be able to, to bring uh, uh, all stakeholders to that result in the panorama survey later in the spring. Um, that will include, uh, and I'm gonna talk to Dr. McNeil about this, uh, see if we can launch an ideas course that might be just, just for participants or members of the Stratton faculty and staff. Obviously we could open that for more folks too, but a lot of people who had gone through that who are on the instructional leadership team point to it as a, um, a way to really accelerate their capacity around these issues. Um, and you'll see later there's a, a, an ask for uh, accelerating the, the funding of a 1.0 uh, FTE uh, library media specialist to support this work. Um, and then finally just a communication device of a monthly newsletter. Our second goal is connected closely because our work on uh, growing um, reading achievement uh, will be connected to the choosing and the implementation of a new tier one uh, literacy program. So uh, we'll be working with the instructional leadership team on that. Um, I think I just wanna highlight what was mentioned uh, by Dr. O'Brien. We lost that point .4 uh, reading specialist simply because we no longer have a Title I designation. And so those uh, resources were, were of Title I funding were elsewhere now in the district. Um, but what that accelerated was our ability to do, as Dr. O'Brien said, the targeted reading instruction for our students who may be struggling but not needing a reading specialist, getting that instruction going in the classroom. So um, it's a, a little bit of a, of a happy accident. Um, and so I just wanted to emphasize that, that that has been a big part of our work during those PMD meetings. And finally, <clears throat> excuse me, a third uh, goal, the uh, particular, um, questions around challenging feelings um, and 
cultural awareness and action for students we want to focus on, and we're doing that by focusing on school language, both uh, the text School Talk by Pollock and Power of Our Words by Paula Denton, which is an anchoring book for a responsive classroom, uh, working on uh, having students feel an, an even uh, stronger sense of belonging uh, by, by focusing on our teacher language. Uh, again, uh, there were you know, a couple of uh, conversations we've had on the Stratton side with uh, uh, Dr. Homan and her cabinet about uh, funding priorities and where the Stratton would emphasize our, um, our asks and it would be uh, talking about doing an ideas course where a lot of the Stratton faculty could participate. Uh, continuing our um, uh, consultation with uh, Jean Thompson Grove, which I can get into a little bit more if you'd like, and finally to increase uh, our full-time uh, library and media specialist to 1.0. Um, and with that, we're happy to hear questions. Thank you. Questions or comments from the committee? Mr. Schlickman. Okay. I've said this uh, before and I'm going to say it again. A good school improvement plan presents a need statement with data and an outcome state statement with data, which are specific. The action plan, which you're full of, is the bridge or the connection from the need statement to the outcome statement. Uh, so next year when you come back to us, I want to see both of those fully developed. That's what I'm looking for. That, that's really the critical part in my mind. Now, looking at your data, you've done extraordinarily well in a lot of places. The only place where I see a weakness as an outsider, because I don't have the ability to look at the student data and aggregate it out the way I would if I was doing this for a living in my own district. But looking at your data, it's strong all over the place, except you had a drop in your growth scores for ELA for high needs and students with disability. That's, that's, that's the big picture that I'm seeing here, which really should be the point that's generating your need statement. Something happened there, could be a cohort effect, could be something else. That's the story behind the academic portion of your plan that I'd expect to see. Now, the one thing that troubles me in the statement is that the MCAS runs on a scale from 440 to 560 with 500 being the benchmark for proficiency. Your literacy scores were 508. You're telling me in your plan on under strategic initiative 2 the spring assessment so scores show a 10 percent increase in reading achievement over scores. That would leave you with an average score of 558.8, which is not achievable. Your outcomes, your measurable outcomes, the things that we're going to hold you accountable for in your plan need to be addressed more clearly. So what is your vision for what you want your MCAS scores to look like this spring? That's my question. Hmm. Well. Clearly, um, I'll have to revisit the statement of goals. Uh, mm -hmm. You can understand that that was a, you know, a rather sweeping global um, mm -hmm. uh, statement about achievement increases that included things like Dibble scores. And mm -hmm. but I'm happy to talk to Dr. Holman mm -hmm. with what she held me accountable for mm -hmm. as far as the drafting of this plan. But this is a plan for us. Mm -hmm. You understand that uh, under state law. School improvement plans go through the school committee. That's why we're all here. Mm -hmm. Okay. I will okay. revisit that and redraft that. Thank you. Anybody else? Ms. Morgan. Um, thank you for this. Um, I had, so I had a, a general question, and this may just be, there's, there's nothing in here that specifically speaks to SLCA, which is a really, you know, a very high needs population. Um, and I, I guess I'm curious if that was intentional, if it was, if, if we're gonna hear about that sort of separate, like how, how I guess I, it's hard for me to feel like some of the students 
who so desperately need access to initiative 1.2, right? They need to feel that they belong in their school community, that school community values and supports them. It's hard for me to feel like they're, that some of those students are gonna benefit from the same action steps that like a sort of a general education population would be. And so I guess I'm curious in the conversations, and I'm sure there were many that went into developing this, if there was any discussion, like was it intentional that that sort of programming isn't called out in this document? Well, I guess in, in some ways I could imagine many, you know, sort of discrete groups being pulled out and, and talking about like how specifically we, we would work with that group. And SLCA would, would be one of them, I suppose. Um, I think that maybe because our data sources aren't you know, teased out like that as far as the panorama survey goes. You know, we're trying to do things that are addressing a sense of belonging. And again, the, the environment where we had the lowest score among all the stakeholders was uh, around cultural awareness and action. So over the August uh, leadership workshop, we ended up emphasizing that. I will say that, you know, the, the partnership or the inclusion of the SLCA program predates m my tenure and I think that the the way that it is woven into the fabric of um, programming at Stratton is really pretty remarkable and uh, not that, that we don't have work to do we work on it every day in one way or another um, but I would say that the current faculty the service providers the paraprofessionals um, that is not the place that I would, you know, look to as a, a place of urgent improvement or address. Um, when we were looking at the data uh, over the summer, there seemed to be, you know, really in many ways hotter fires. Um, but again, I appreciate, Jane, the, the idea of, of having sort of discrete plans for uh, creating a sense of belonging for all students, including that particular population. And I'll remember that as we're kind of talking about actions anyway. Great, and I think that, uh, and the other thing that I, I wanted to say, and this is maybe more general too for Dr. Homan, because we've, we've seen, so obviously we're, we're trying to get better at our, at our you know, specific data outcomes, right? And like using MCAS scores is something that, mm -hmm. it's one of the metrics that we have, right? Um, and, and looking at, so, and we've seen this in other SIPs too. So the, when we talk about increasing the average, whether it's 10% or 2% or whatever it is, right? When you're, when you're increasing that, that score, that mean score, you can basically do that by just pushing your top kids to get more points mm -hmm. on that test and do nothing about anybody who's, who's not at standard, right? Mm -hmm. Like if, if, you're, if you're trying to, if you're saying, well, we wanna go from whatever, I don't know what you said it was, 508. 508, 508 yeah. maybe your goal is to get to 520 but like you can actually do that with all of your exceeds expectations. They could, they could make that up for you, right? Um, and so I guess what I would like us to think about when we're doing this is, is that the right thing to be, is that, is that, what the, is that the number we wanna focus on or is it around the sort of percentage of kids and various focus groups that are meeting expectations, right? And are those the percentages we're trying to like shove? Because we wanna bring, these kids up mm -hmm. to meeting expectations um, as opposed to maybe moving that that score, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Totally. Um, yeah. So that, that's just something that I think about um, because it, it well, I, I appreciate that everybody is working to move everybody to benchmark, right? Like that's the goal, but when that outcome can be achieved by just pushing the highest mm -hmm. kids higher then maybe we just want to change, like tweak that sure. a little bit. So thank you. Anybody else? All right. Thank you both very much for being here. We appreciate Can it. Can I really yeah. quick? Yeah. Um, 
I just want to commend the Stratton School. Some of the work that they've done to get in front of our work around ILTs and to collaborate with Gene Thompson Grove started last year. And they were quick to jump on that and to think about what a really strong ILT would look like. And the work they've done with their ILT is incredible and commendable. I joined a faculty meeting that the entire ILT led with them. Um, that really helped the staff pull out those things that they thought that the school needed to work on. And so the work that they're doing is truly coming from the staff and from the experiences that they have on the ground with students and is going to be really impactful to practice in the classroom. So nice work, Stratton, and great to see you. Thanks so much, Thank Dr. Hallman. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thompson School Improvement Plan. Ms. Donato. I was just laughing because nine years ago I didn't need glasses to read what I was going to be saying tonight. But here we are. You look distinguished. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. I went old school and printed mine out too, so. <clears throat> Always good to have a backup. <laughs> well, good evening, uh, Dr. Holman, uh, school committee members and community members. I think my family's watching at home, so hi, family. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> my name is Karen Donato. And I am the appreciative, proud, and joy-filled principal of Thompson School. I'm joined here tonight by amazing assistant principal, Krishna Chevalier, and our incredible math coach, Sonia Connolly. Um, in thinking about tonight's update, I reflected on the creation of last year's SIP, as well as how these plans have evolved over my nine years um, serving the Thompson community. When I began, I remember looking at the school improvement plan, and it was pages and pages and pages long and they were full of amazing initiatives and goals and at that time they were more about quantifying all the good work that we were doing and maybe a few initiatives that uh, we were planning to do um, and i feel like for thompson and other schools each grade would have a goal the departments would have goals so there was about 10 goals in those school improvement plans um, over the years we've had various iterations and i believe that our three-year sip that we developed last year is truly reflective of a data of data informed goals and action steps that will be able to serve our entire student population um, with dr homan's guidance and input from various stakeholders and i'd say most importantly our experiences from the pandemic we have been able to focus on fewer initiatives to be done well uh, the old less is more adage as i like to say so in our actual sip uh, you will find that very little has been changed from the plan we presented last year as it was designed to be implemented and achieved over three years. But what we have changed are the action steps for our instructional objective centered on implementing the practice of student discourse, um, specifically we're focusing in math. So that change was made to better represent the heart of what we want to achieve in creating an environment uh, where all students have the opportunity to learn in an, in an equitable environment. So all that being said, to my update, here's kind of what we're going to go through. Um, I chose this pic these pictures because in our opening staff meeting this year, we did some work with the new district vision statement. And part of the activity was having staff seek out other members that they may not know and trying to build the, world joy the word joy. They had to take a letter when they came in. They didn't know what they were spelling. Um, which was great because, you know, when you have a, a staff that's been together for a long time and you, this year we had a number of new staff, it was nice to kind of force people in a way to find people that they weren't particularly, um, that they didn't particularly know. So the entire theme of our staff meeting was around joy, what brings us joy personally and professionally. And um, I just really like those little snapshots of some of our staff. So by the numbers, this is Thompson by the numbers. This is a snapshot of who our 516 students are. We have 24 class sections this year with four at most grade levels, but we have bubbles of five sections in first grade and three sections in fifth grade. And Thompson's diverse population consists of students who are 62.8% of students who identify as white, 5.2% identify as African American, 12.6% as Asian, 9.1% as, 9 as Hispanic Latino, and 10.1% as multi-race. And of our 516 students, 23% of our population is considered socio, socially, socioeconomically disadvantaged. Um, we currently have 47 EL students, 
31 of whom are considered level one or two beginners, and 16 who are considered level three and four intermediate students. This is just a recap of what our initiatives were from last year that were in the FIP. I'm gonna go through each one, um, our priorities for each slide. Okay, this slide shows the updated data that informed our objective presented last year. That objected, objective is that if staff and teachers work to strengthen tier one instruction and improve the instructional practice of student discourse, the percentage of all students meeting math assessment benchmarks across all grade levels will increase. So as you can see, our math MCAS scaled score data and student growth percentile data increased across all race categories from 2021 to 2022. While that is certainly promising to see, we continue to highlight that our black students and Hispanic students are not performing at a rate similar to that of their white peers. We continue to work on elevating culturally responsive teaching practices such as student discourse to support our students to be seen and heard and, their, and have their voices heard in the classroom. The 2022 data is similar to the data ranges of 2018 and 2019, and we anticipate that with this work, we will see increased progress over the next two years. Ah, you've got your golden pineapples. This is related to that. <laughs> um, this slide is an example to support our work on, on our objective number two, by establishing a PBIS team to support staff and students, we will further our commitment to providing an environment where all students feel safe physically and emotionally to learn and take risks and staff have the tools and strategies to support them. Over the past year, we have established a PBIS team, even solicited some additional members this year, which is great. Uh, we've completed a staff survey for input on the rollout and identified our core values of being safe be responsible and be respectful. This visual is a small piece of our PBIS behavior matrix, and that highlights each of these values and what they look like, feel like, and sound like in all areas of the building. This example identifies the expectation that to be safe means to show safe bodies and use safe words. That's what you see on the left. Across the top are the identified spaces of learning spaces, the cafeteria, bathrooms, hallway, and recess. And in each box under the spaces are what it looks like, feels like, and sounds like to be safe. Um, the full matrix has additional sections for being respectful and being responsible. This is just the be safe section. I couldn't get it all on the same slide. Thank you. So under the direction of Ms. Chevalier, at the beginning of the year, the students received explicit instruction in each area about what the expectations are and had the opportunity to see them modeled and to ask clarifying questions. In addition to the matrix, we have also been able to get our incentive system off the ground. The golden pineapples, one of which you each have, I'll give you whether it was responsible, respectful, or safe at the end. Um, but the golden pineapples for class acknowledgments, and then we have individual pineapple tickets for demonstrating the core values. These tickets are accumulated by class, grade level, and ultimately by school, and we have had many class level rewards already. We recently had our first grade level rewards uh, achieved in our first and fourth graders. They are in the process of deciding what the grade level reward will be, and that's chosen from a menu of options. Thank you. So this is our, the slide supports our equity and school culture objective. And that reads, if staff engage in professional learning opportunities that increase their understanding and awareness of bias, identity development, and emphasize data-driven, culturally responsive teaching practices, student learning as measured by MCAS and benchmark math assessments will increase. As you can see, this data that I presented isn't actually related to math, but this objective is connected to our first instructional objective where we uh, showed that we are making some growth in our math MCAS. But what informed this objective last year was our panorama data, and specifically we honed in on two questions. While this year's data isn't yet available, this, this snapshot from March on the left and fall of 2021 on the right demonstrates that there's work to be done. If we are not actually explicitly encouraging our students to think more deeply about race, related topics and facilitating and teaching them how to engage in developmentally appropriate conversations around race, that we are truly not seeing and acknowledging who our students are. 
And if our students don't see themselves represented in the curriculum, don't feel seen or heard in the classroom, then their learning is impacted. And at the core of being able to do that work with our students is the work that we need to do as a staff. We must first do it with ourselves and find ways to infuse that work into our planning and then into our instruction. With our commitment to elevating the practice of student discourse, continuing with our book study of culturally responsive teaching and the brain, and the professional development opportunities with outside providers such as PFLAG and our internal PD opportunities, we continue to, toward our goal of providing an equitable learning environment for all of our students. These last two slides are just a brief summary of what we, we use the term glows and grows. So glows are things, obviously, that have gone well, and grows are areas that we're still growing on. So some of our glows from the past year, uh, we've established our instructional leadership team, which is guiding the work of the SIP, our school improvement plan. Uh, we are regularly using our ACE time to provide staff the opportunity for collaborative structures to analyze data and discuss instructional practices, such as student discourse. We've seen growth in our math MCAS scaled scores and growth percentiles across all identified races. We've established our PBIS team, implemented our school-wide expectations matrix, and implemented our, our recognition system of the pineapple tickets and the golden pineapples. And we've had some building-based PD um, with PFLAG. And our grows, we continue to have ongoing collaboration and coaching of staff to design and implement lessons with key practices for facilitating student discourse. We are focusing on that. We're implement we need to implement a tool to collect data regarding office referrals as a measure of the impact that PBIS is having. Uh, we, are, we need to identify a staff survey to, administ to administer to assess the needs regarding bias and identity development. Increase our time dedicated to staff discussion of culturally responsive teaching in the brain chapters and purposeful discussion around cultural competency. Professional development to support implementation of culturally responsive teaching practices. And our data shows that our students need thoughtful, explicit instruction around discussing and naming of race-related topics. Um, in closing, I want to be sure to acknowledge how grateful we are at Thompson for the ongoing support of the district administration, this committee, and our community at large, and the families who support the work that we do each and every day. We continue to be committed to meeting the needs of our students academically, socially, and emotionally. And I also would like to highlight that recovering from the pandemic is going to take time. Even though this year is considered normal, students, and even more so our staff, are feeling the cumulatively effect the cumulative effects of these pandemic years i hope that as we move forward as a district with our many valuable initiatives that we may also keep that less is more concept in mind when considering the demands that these will place on those at the building level thank you for your time this evening sorry about that <laughs> thank you yes thank you uh, questions or comments from the committee mr slickman Okay, uh, first of all, 15% growth in your MCAS score for your uh, African American population? Mm -mm. Over three years. No, 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 15%. That's what I'm saying. Uh, go back to the metrics 500, it's a scale of 430 to 560. Mm -hmm. And so that if you were at a 490, 490 times 1.15 puts you where you're never going to get to. It's not a realistic number. It's not a good way to measure it. you got to, you got to reframe that some other way. Okay. Uh, the one thing I want to, I, I appreciate the fact that you had the, uh, the data as a starting point in consideration of where you wanted to go. So uh, it, it, it enables me to ask the follow-up question. You're looking at African-American students, but when I look at the, the, the data that's publicly available on the DESE website for school accountability. The, the real divide I'm seeing within the school is low income versus everybody else. Um, your thoughts on that? Yes, I mean, that, that, is, that is a big piece of the struggle that we're facing and the need to address, mm. I, mm. I believe, um, that those two groups aren't mutually exclusive. And mm -hmm. I think that there's crossover amongst all of our high needs um, categories that mm -hmm. contribute to that. Um, are you asking why are we not gonna specifically focus on that population versus? I, I won't do that. Okay. Because I don't wanna 
put you that much on the spot because if I were, look, I, I analyzed uh, school improvement plans for a living in Lowell, Massachusetts, which was under state scrutiny, which meant that every I had to be dotted, every T had to be crossed. And I'm happy to be a lot more relaxed about this in a, dis in a high performing district. But uh, in, in looking at the data and looking at co uh, coming to us in terms of what we're thinking about as a school committee, how do we help the Thompson School if the data is telling me we need to do something for low income kids and that's in the school improvement plan is that one of the things you're looking at are low income kids, then that points us and you and the superintendent is a partnership in terms of looking for, okay, what do we do systemically as a district to assist the Thompson in terms of meeting the needs of high income kids? And, and then able to go and take a look, is this, a, is this a district wide question in our elementary schools? And if it is, how do we go and find something in common, Thompson to Bishop to Brackett that, that, that helps this cohort where there is a significant gap, both in terms of achievement and growth. You understand what I'm saying? I do. Yeah. I do. I will take, you can, I'll take a closer look at that. Who yeah, I, I, I want, I want okay. you know, if, if the data is similar next year, I'm gonna be looking for high, uh, for, for the low income versus sure. not low income Have kids uh, on your school improvement plan. Okay, thank Dr. you. Dr. Holman. Um, I would just like to comment, because I think some of these are is feedback more for me than it is for our leaders. Mm -hmm. And I also am wondering if that 15% increase is a reflection of the number of the percentage of students, the percentage point increase of students who are meeting or exceeding standards as opposed to an in percent increase in the actual scaled score. So I will go back with leaders mm -hmm. and take a look at that and think about how we present mm -hmm. some of that um, to be really clear about exactly what we mean when we're talking about an increase. Yeah, you need to this have specificity in that. Yep, this it, is it's, something it's that's definitely an issue. And we, we saw that in the in the bracket plan mm -hmm. uh, a month ago. And I was hoping that going forward that we'd be more, uh, have those eyes dotted when we came, when we came forth. Yes, I understand. Forward. And the strategic plan's going to do some work modeling mm -hmm. exactly what we want that to look like so that we have something mm -hmm. that we can build on as uh, they're building their plans in future years. And their deadline was to have this to us mm -hmm. well before any of mm -hmm. these came before the school committee. So I will keep that in mind in mm -hmm. providing feedback and making sure that that is clear. In all, we, we were very sure. prescriptive about uh, what we expected to see in terms of the structure of the plan. Mm -hmm. And just making that bridge, need statement, desired outcome, and making sure that the the action plan was a connection between the two and that I had schools that were doing wacky things by deciding, oh, we want to buy some program, having that as their action step, and then writing the whole plan about trying to justify that rather than doing a really good analysis of the need statement to, to the desired outcome. And again, I, I want to emphasize this is a high performing district and as I go through this data, there's really a lot of very good things here. A lot of good things happening, but in terms for the, uh, for the uh, improvement plans to be helpful, the helpful tool that we need and to have it at this point in the process, it's a guide to our budget process so that we, that we have justification in terms of saying, how are we going to reallocate our resources to bring ourselves to another level? Anybody else? Mr. Thielman? I I just want to say that all the uh, SIP, all, all the presentations have been great and very informative, and I, I appreciate all the work that everyone's put into it. I, I would say, you know, in this conversation, I, this conversation we've had, we're having about what should or shouldn't be in a SIP. I think it might be a good, good discussion to take place at a curriculum meeting, mm -hmm. the superintendent and everyone else mm -hmm. there to kind of hash out what the school committee actually wants, because I think it's a little... Of course, always, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Jane, I, I didn't see you. I'm so sorry. I just, I, 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 how's the agenda for next <laughs> meeting? Uh, uh, that's a great suggestion, uh, Mr. Thielman. Anybody else want to comment time. on the Thompson I, School Improvement Plan, Ms. Yeah. Morgan? Um, I just, I had a question about PBIS, because last year I was really confused about PBIS, and then... Um, you helped me a lot while we talked about the SIP, and then I was like, I need to go read about this. And so now I'm like, oh, now I could. So I guess just so that I know where we're at, this 
we're now in t in year two of a three year plan. Is that like kind of <clears throat> your, like is that your vision? That was my thinking, right? So okay, and so I, I'm assuming that you're already seeing a decrease in office referrals. We're, we're seeing definitely a an increase in consistency across practice in okay. all areas of the building. So students are hearing the same language in music as they're hearing in the cafeteria, as they're hearing in the classrooms, which th does actually lead to a decrease in office referrals. We have to come up with a system to track them succinctly. So that's the piece that's our next. We've actually had a, had a uh, PBIS meeting today we have a draft of a referral um, system that we're going to implement shortly after the break. Okay, great. I want to hear about that next year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Chair sure. Ellis? No? Okay. Dr. Hummel? Um, every time I walk into Thompson, it is a joyful, happy, bustling, very busy place with a whole lot of kids. And every time you walk into a Thompson classroom, students are talking, using academic language, very engaged by their teachers, um, getting on a plane to travel somewhere, I think, in one of the no, place, classes I visited, that was yet. social studies class. Um, and their f steadfast focus on um, race and equity and culturally responsive teaching and reading a common text together to better understand who they are and who, what their identities that they bring into the work and how that impacts kids is really commendable. So thank you very much. I always love visiting. And seeing all the pineapples. <laughs> and sorry, getting teary in that last statement. I just, mm -hmm. we're working really hard. And I want I, to make sure everyone knows that. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Nano, I actually wanted, I wanted to, to thank you for your sort of honesty or vulnerability or um, getting emotional. It has, mm -hmm. it has been a very challenging um, last three years in schools. And I know that teachers at all of the schools and the administration are working incredibly hard to support students who have been through a lot and adults who have been through a lot. So I appreciate um, all the work that you have done and we as a committee would like to support all of you in, in continuing your great work. So thank you. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Budget requests report. Okay. Dr. I am going to share my screen. Give me one moment. I need to make sure I share the right thing. I will get us started and then Mr. Mason can sort of walk you through, through how this is formatted and how to read it in case there are any questions about that. Um, we have been through a comprehensive budget process. This is our second round doing um, the request process in the way that we are. We tweaked a couple of things this year. Uh, just to remind everybody of what this process looks like, we have all of the managers of every cost center, operational and instructional in the district, including our schools, department leads, um, come before the cabinet team to talk about the uh, additions, asks, efficiencies they can identify um, based in the needs of their building. Our presentations this year were very data driven, which was great. Um, leaders brought evidence to support the things that they felt like they needed. They were very thoughtful about what the needs were, and we were able to have some really fantastic discussions with leaders and probe some of the asks and think about what alternatives might be. And so even in this request report, what we've given you is exactly what was requested, but we had some conversations too about where we could combine, um, what additional possibilities there may be, uh, or on the high school counseling note, because there's a couple of requests in there related to that. I went and met with the high school guidance counselors and had a lengthy conversation with them about what some of the needs might be for their department as numbers continue to grow at the high school. So we've really been able to have some rich conversations about each of these asks uh, and hopefully can speak to any questions you have about them. A couple of themes that are emerging this year. One is that we have increasing enrollments at the secondary level. Um, into Audison as these larger class sizes move through Gibbs to Audison next year and then into the high school. We've done a really nice job sort of making sure we have the core instructional staffing to support that. At the Audison we've expanded the LCs, um, but the surrounding staffing to support some of that is what is needed next. Some of, we need a little more elective um, staffing at the high school level and at uh, OMS to support some bigger class sizes in PE, for example, in facts classes, some of those classes that surround the core areas. 
Another theme this year is some of the support that surrounds the people who are in the classroom. So there are asks that will improve infrastructure, um, support staff, our ability to provide strong communications to families in the district, uh, to support the Welcome Center that will be part of the strategic plan, um, additional supports at the high school that will be linked to the opening of the new building and that really go to support all of the new systems of the new building. Um, so you'll notice that there are a lot of, uh, oh, also um, a lot of people were supporting the build out of the D. EI department so that we'd have additional professional development support in the district that could do some of the innovative professional learning work that we've been trying to do. Um, so it, it's not as because we've sort of built the student facing capacity of the district as enrollments have increased. It, it's not as focused on direct enrollment support as it has been in previous years um, with the exception of the, of the secondary level. You'll see more asks that sort of surround that where we haven't built out as much capacity in previous years because we've been so focused on enrollment growth. So that those are sort of some trends that you might notice as you look through some of the requests. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about our librarian staffing and building that out. Um, about in continuing to work on building our technology teaching capacity at the elementary level as well. Um, a couple of requests that are uh, directly linked to increases in uh, special education, uh, student enrollment, and English learner in our schools. Um, a couple of these we're even considering fast tracking this year and going ahead and posting for soon. Uh, because we have a little bit of buffer because we haven't been able to hire and the need is present now. So those are some possibilities depending on how conversations go over the next few weeks. We might be um, preemptively posting and as a matter of fact already preemptively posted the EL position at Pierce for example that was requested by three different groups and is a present need. So um, that's a quick overview. It's a long report. I'm happy to or Mr. Mason is happy to answer any questions and if there are questions that we can't answer because we need to go back to our leaders for more clarity, we can always bring those back to budget subcommittee. Mr. Carter. Just a big piece. So what's, what's your next steps? Um, so we have a budget subcommittee. Um, Ms. Al or Dr. Alice Nampy, do you know when it is? I think I'm trying to schedule it right now. I'm hoping next week. Okay. Um, so talk today. Um, <laughs> begin to rank these. So you'll see that there's a priority ranking um, in here. And that's helping us think through uh, where we want to sort of draw an initial line um, and say everything above this we know we absolutely need to fund. Everything below it is sort of up for discussion. Um, have that conversation in budget subcommittee hopefully next week. And then we have a follow-up meeting with the full administrative team on January 3rd where we're hoping to give them an update, show them what all of the requests are, have them have some discussion about that, see if any um, prioritization emerges from those conversations. That will help us begin to create sort of priority buckets. One analysis that needs to happen next is for us to analyze uh, what our contractual obligations are going to be and therefore how much room we have to maneuver within but that's sort of projecting what long-range planning is going to do and what our final number is going to be so we, we're, we're in a bit of a guessing game right now we need that final number from the town um, but we're going to operate probably conservatively in determining what we put into an initial draft of the budget and then we'll be looking at drafts with uh, budget subcommittee over the course of january i'm sure did you want to add anything you stated it very I think you stated it very well. I think that, um, yeah, I think the, the key thing is, you know, look at the salary obligations that we have for next year or any other contracts that are beyond salary that are obligations that we're contractually tied to, like, for example, how we, where we park our buses and whatnot. There are certain contracts that we have in place so to ensure that those are going to remain the same level or not, whatnot. So, um, and then, yeah to decide what that actual, the space for us to move in between will actually be. There's a little less guesswork this year too because we will not be negotiating seven contracts in between mm -hmm. when we build a budget and when the year actually starts. Anybody else? Mr. Schlickman. Okay. Um, there's a lot of stuff on this. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it appears to be very thoughtful, and I'm, I'm really appreciative of the fact that there are 
reductions as well as additions that, that you're going and taking a look at how we can sort of readjust our priorities on items in the, bu bu in the bubble. So this is a good thing. Uh, my two question, one on the far right of this thing says number of requests. Is that sort of a count of how many people within the district have sort of asked for that? Yeah, let me, let, let me can, I, can I take a second to just explain an overview of what people are yeah, seeing? Because yeah, yeah. that was what I was going to do. Um, and so um, you'll see that, yes, the priority <clears throat> is what the department or the average of what the requests are. So every, all um, administrative leaders were giving a form to complete this year. Mm -hmm. um, and on that form request, they had a priority rating of from one to five, one being the highest, five being the lowest. Mm -hmm. um, and then so the number of requests would follow through with what other, like how many people had a sim similar request, mm -hmm. um, or if they brought it up in our actual discussion in our meeting. So we had cabinet meetings where department heads um, came, pre presented on their request, as well as any other thing that they were in favor of. Um, this is due to increased collaboration throughout the district. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's what also the number of requests is tabulating. So when you're seeing the format of this, this is separated into three different parts. You're, you're seeing the top part, or the first seven pages is just a personnel recurring request that we, if we add these, these would be ongoing um, and add to the base. Mm -hmm. You'll have non-personnel, that's similar, that's gonna be recurring, and then the last is one-time costs, which we'll speak about, um, which could possibly be covered with maybe current year funds, mm -hmm. um, or um, if we, we can defer and put it into next year's budget. Um, each section is sorted by school or location, mm -hmm. and then based on prior, a, a scoring system of uh, or a calculation, a calculated score that looks at the priority and number of requests. So obviously the more requests, and the higher the priority gets pushed up further to the top. If there are, there are requests that do not have scores, um, they, we, we're still circling back with them. Those were brought up to us in the actual budget meeting and a priority wasn't easily identified. Um, and so those will be lower on the list. Does not mean that it's not prioritized. Okay, so I, I, I just wanted to get clarity because you know, I'm taking a look at, uh, say, for example, and I know this is silly because I think I can logic it out. If I take a look at uh, the theater manager at Arlington High School, it's priority one, number of requests three. So basically, I'm not multiplying that 60,000 by three because we don't want three Correct. theater managers. Correct. So I, I can just sort of look upon that is a sub priority of three people within the team are saying that but it is a number one priority Correct. Um, is it possible to get us this in an excel sheet that we can sort yeah. because i mean it, it's a comprehensive list but it's a list and to, to be able to sort this and sort of make, think about the priorities on our own i think would be really 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 helpful yeah. i can give you the raw data of the forms if that's helpful, but it may not include every single request. That I'm, I'm sure that what you've got here is is perfectly fine, but okay. right now it's a PDF, and you've got and if, if I could just get the line item, the description, location, program, FTE amount, priority, and number of requests. That line for each thing here in an Excel sheet, because then I can support, sort by priority, I can sort by category, I can, I, I can have a good time sorting. Got it. You, you know what yeah. I mean? Got it. Doing it right now. Yeah, thanks. Ms. Morgan, who, who picked the priority? Who put in the ones and the twos and the threes? The oh, and then somebody did, somebody did it 1.5. I love it, with, <laughs> love it when people do that. Oh, that's, that drives well, that's, the, So the priority is an average of the request. Oh. So if two people put in a request, so that 1.5 is one person put a one, another person put a two. Average of the two is 1.5. So they had to prioritize. It was whole numbers. It wasn't a 1.5. So what they, <laughs> they selected one. So two people put in two different requests for the same, well, put in two different forms for the same request. Okay, so like Spanish teacher, 307 
kids taking Spanish. It gives, mm -hmm. right? So that's going to cost us 70 grand, and it's priority 1.5, and there were two requests. So somebody put in a one and somebody put in a two? Yes, mm -hmm. correct. Okay, so the prioritization, if, if stated, is the level of priority of the submitter. Yes. Correct. Mm -hmm. I am with you now. Mm. Okay. Sorry, that wasn't clear. I mean, it take well. I mean, I'm kind of impressed that we have people who go to the trouble of submitting something, and they're like, "Well, but this is really priority three. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. well, one of the and, it, and that was actually a really we didn't ask them to do that last year, and it was a good exercise because it helps us understand like of these things, which of these things are things that you feel like are an urgent need right now. What was the percentage breakdown of like number of priority one requests versus? It was about it was about fifty percent. I mean, there are a lot of ones on here. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I mean, yes. which there should be. Yeah. Right? I actually thought it would be more <laughs> than it was. So no, I think this is really important, and I I. This is the this is the list that I'm like this is like the happy list. Look at all these like five million dollars worth of things that we mm. want, and this is like so great. And then eventually, like it gets sort of sad because things go above the line and things go below the mm. line. But for right now, I just I like having this nice big list. Mm. So thank you. This was no small feat because we saw this in budget like a week ago, and it was rougher that like way it was rough, mm. and so it's come a long way since then. So this is a ton of work. Thank you very much. Mr. Thielman. So, so my question, I guess, is for Dr. Holman. The, the process by which you're going to whittle down this list and make your recommendations, that's going to happen internally. You're going to be in dialogue with our budget subcommittee and the school committee. And then at some point, what are we going to get as a collective, as a committee? So we're a little hesitant to start really doing above and below the line until we've heard from you all what your priorities are. Okay. Um, but I think we can begin the exercise because we know, like, Again, we, we know that urgently we need an EL teacher at Pierce. So there are right. some things that we can go ahead and say, we know we want to prioritize this. We can share that with all of you. If your priorities differ from those things, then certainly you should let us know that. And that'll be part of the conversation with budget subcommittee. And once we've heard the school committee's priorities, we can start to really narrow down what would be in the proposed budget. Okay, so maybe for I, I'm just trying to get a sense of what our time, what the time when are we when is the school committee going to I'm sorry it was to put no, the proposed trying, budget trying to open the document early February okay. first meeting of February so I the school committee priorities are um, we present our priorities at the next school committee I thought in that's January a, yes. in January I okay, think it's my, a January. sorry I couldn't get yeah. the document so it's a January bit. event and our our prep for you then. At the, Jan at the next meeting in January is to go through this and be prepared to kind of say, where do we think our priorities based on mm -hmm. whatever we want to base it on. <coughs> Got it. Yeah. So January 12th, we present our committee members present their budget priorities. The 9th currently is the proposed date for the superintendent to present her proposed budget to us. The 2nd of March will be um, the public hearing okay. and then we would hopefully be right. able to approve it. All right. That. Thank you very much. <laughs> Anybody else? Um, I have a, no. oh, go, uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. Thank you. Um, in my journey from one place to the other, I left my questions at, in my home office, so I can't ask them, but I was thinking I'll just send uh, Mr. Mason an email with some of my specific questions about things, and um, he can either respond or, or we can discuss it. At, uh, budget. Yeah. I can't hear any. I, no one's yes. saying anything. Yes. <laughs> yes, that, okay. yes, that's fine. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, Thank you. So I just have, I have sort of a very specific question, which I know this is still under process, but with the, kin, uh, the K to five literacy resources, I don't see any professional development listed in here we're not going to provide any no. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to have to wing it i'm going to wing it good job good luck yeah. upon my departure no i'm just kidding Don't figure um, it out. <laughs> no so we when we go through the implementation plan uh, a lot of these uh, vendors we're definitely going to as we start off we're going to negotiate that with them as we buy the whole program. So hopefully they'll throw that in there. And then as we look at our implementation plan after we select that, but I, when we start to have these um, 
talks with the vendors because that's the next thing that we're going to do right now is I'm going to work with um, Dr. Burns, who is the executive director of Hill for Literacy, and we're going to look at the programs and try to cost them out. And then that will be also include the uh, professional development that goes along with it. So a lot of times when you buy these, you buy a new textbook series or you buy new materials from a vendor, you include that in the whole package. Okay. So the, the price that we present to school committee for the program that we select will include the professional development that goes along with it. And so we use that as a bargaining chip. We're buying your product, so what can we get for free? So I'm always trying to do that. Uh, in order to see what kind of discounts we can get on the professional development. All right, we won't show them this number. Um, All right. Did the curriculum adoption line end up in here? Because mm -hmm. you were talking about it later. Okay, yeah. I just it's couldn't find it. So we are projecting 200000 for curriculum adoption, also as something that I would hope would stay in the budget for the next several years, and the professional development could be wrapped into that. If it exceeded that, we do have the opportunity for the next year to use ESSER dollars towards some of this implementation work um, and or to use ESSER dollars to pre-purchase out a couple of grade levels if we have to um, to sort of offset the impact on the budget of the rollout over the next few years. And I also would kind of like us to have a curriculum review. You'll see this in the strategic plan, but a curriculum review cycle where we're sort of regularly saying, you know, here's the order of curriculum areas that are going to get a refresh on texts or on mm -hmm. software or on materials, and, and that'll be tied to an audit cycle for curriculum areas. So each year we can anticipate there will be adoption in some curriculum area in response to us doing an internal audit of a curriculum area. This is something that other districts have in place that we don't have sort of a regular cycle on um, that we could put in place and that would be linked to that curriculum adoption line that we're adding here. Okay, thank you. And I also want to add, we're going to leverage the expertise of our literacy coaches and that's where they'll, they'll be very instrumental in providing the professional development as well. I want to make sure they, they get their professional development. Right. Absolutely, exactly. they will be the first ones that we take uh, provide that for. And then my other question um, is this what I seems to be a transition from a K to 12 coordinator <coughs> to a K to 5 coordinator and a 6 to 12 coordinator. So I will speak to that. Um, one of the possibilities that we were discussing as part of our conversations about DEI specialists as well and building out the DEI department was the ability for us to have some shared leadership between the curriculum areas and the DEI department. And, so, and we were also talking about the possibility of a humanities or an ELA K-5 to coordinator, which is a request that has come before the committee in the past, to support some of the rollout of the implementation of a new curriculum. If there were to be a K-5 to ELA or humanities coordinator, and we sort of discussed the humanities idea because it puts disciplinary areas together, allows us to do more interdisciplinary work, um, allows us to cover more disciplinary areas with a single role. Um, if we were to do that, it would mean reorganizing the existing director roles to be 6 to 12, which would be more sustainable in terms of evaluation. Right now, they are not very sustainable for evaluation simply because we've expanded staffing so significantly over the last several years. Um, but it's a possibility on the table. I don't know that it's necessarily the top priority at the moment, uh, but it is something we've been discussing, and it would certainly increase the capacity of the rollout of the ELA curriculum if we were to have additional leadership. Um, Mr. Mason, monthly financial oh. report, please. <laughs> Sorry, I was uh, just like focused on something. Share. Bless you. All right. Good evening, good evening, school committee members. Um, tonight. Um, yeah, I'm going to present to you the, the monthly financials for finances as of November 30th, 2022. Um, and Novus, you'll, this is the same presentation, but I realized after uploading it that the we were using the old branding, so I wanted to correct my slides with the correct branding, but there's no difference besides color schemes. And so um, in the reports, you would have uh, received your general fund 
um, which is the town appropriation, um, revolving in special revenue, the grants, which included this time the fiscal 23 entitlement grants, prior year carryover grants. Um, we were working on some, um, this munis our financial system uh, did some adjustments to budgets that were incorrect. Um, so we uh, withheld um, some of the COVID related grants. Those will be in the next financial report or in an updated version of the report and sent to you. So the general fund, um, overall, uh, we're gonna project a, a balance <coughs> currently of one million, which is down from the previous projected balance as I was expecting it to go down. Um, many of this is, uh, this actual, the, this balance here is the true balance from our positions that are unfilled um, and some smaller um, variances of, um, you know, having less uh, out of district placements. But um, for the most part, our, this is this a pretty solid number at this point. We are looking at um, potentially what you'll see is ideas of um, taking some of the one-time costs that are coming up in the budget request and possibly using that um, to spend down some of this projected balance as well as um, trying to determine if there are any positions that are in need that we're looking to do for next year, we might you know, uh, potentially uh, start looking to post positions to cover um, those needs. Um, this is this this is uh, the budget transfer by budget transfer categories. Um, overall, uh, this is where we stand. Anything that's in the red shaded color is the actuals. Grays or which was on your report was like an orange gray color. Um, that is the encumbered amounts, and so all of them and still are spending in plan. I'd imagine that we would have to propose uh, a transfer for any of the requested spending um, that if for current, uh, for the fiscal 24 spending, um, cause that would likely put some of them over, um, but uh, th nothing to propose at this point. And this is the same thing, actual versus budget, but this is looking at it in a month by month basis and as well, we're, we're hanging in there tight. Special revenue um, and revolving at a glance, um, basically we are collected um, cash in our, or expecting, projecting to collect cash that's gonna cover our current spending rate. Um, what I didn't mention is that there's some identified transfers that, uh, you know, some incorrect uh, expense posted. Um, based on athletic salaries being posted to a, a revolving fund that no longer is collecting fees, thanks to eliminating fees. So we'll be moving those uh, stipends over to the, to the, to the appropriate accounts on the general fund. Um, and any, uh, there's a net uh, change between uh, tuition that can be put on the circuit breaker as well. But uh, overall, our total, our, we're, we're expecting to not move too much in terms of where we started from this by the end of the year. Um, in the report, I did a projected amount in terms of the circuit breaker amount that we're gonna collect for this year, which we'll budget for next year. And then overall, the, this is the grants. Um, we've been spending our prior year grants down. Um, we carry in around $780,000 worth on the, the, the carryover grants and um, we had it was awarded about 2.5 million on our entitlement grant. So right now we're spending according to plan, we're around $900,000 in terms of expenditures and about another 1.4 encumbered. Um, and we hope to spend uh, more down of our prior year grants as well as the ESSER funds. If you have any questions, uh, I will leave it to the chair. Mr. Hainer. Uh, Mr. Mason, the line on legal services, that, does that cover all our legal services, including SPED? Correct. Uh, it, on the line it says uh, projected expenses, 79000 plus. Is that basically uh, SPED going forward or 
No, it's just a formula to project. Um, to meet this That'll problem. become more clear as the year ends? Correct. Thank That's, you. There's no known legal expenses. Thank you. Mr. Slickman. Um, great report. And, and I'm always impressed by the detail and the thoughtfulness, <laughs> the way things are put out, because with, with a little bit of work and sitting here and studying it, you, you got a good sense of what's going on. Um, the two, I, I'm not going to ask you about the deficit in, uh, in electric because that could be shocking. But <laughs> bad point. Uh, <laughs> that, that I just was, got that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Fine. <laughs> um, the two, the two I want to ask about: contracted transportation is it uh, over by two hundred nine thousand? Uh, is there something driving that? Just give me one second, because I would. Uh, line eight three three zero one. Page three of 16. That's what you were talking about. Mm -hmm. My novice is just run a little slower, sorry. Mm -hmm. So, page what? Which, which page? Page are you for? three of 16. Yep. 83301, contracted transportation. If I look at first glance, it looks like. Um, for that particular line, uh, budget may have been moved out of that line. I'd have to further verify what happened in that department, particular category, that particular category in that department. Okay, and uh, professional tech services, um, we're uh, we're running a two hundred ninety-four thousand dollar deficit. I'm I'm assuming that we're taking advantage of some of the uh, money that isn't being spent elsewhere. Yep, so, so the professional tech services, those are tied to encumbrances that um, for outside contractor services mm -hmm. um, tied to hiring staff mm -hmm. that we couldn't hire, um, that we posted jobs for. So they're providing services. That's what the professional tech services line, some of the professional tech services line, but that's what's driving that. Aha, uh -huh. so we didn't hire the person. We're taking a, so, something out of that line item as a contracted thing. Correct. And, okay, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Mason. No problem. Superintendent's report, Dr. Holman. All right. Okay, I will get started with a strategic planning update. We have completed all of our community forums. Our remote, our last one remote was our most populated. We had about uh, 25 families join us and had some great conversations in breakout rooms and got some feedback uh, to help us with some of the finalization of our initiative drafts. I wanna thank the community leaders and stakeholders who participated in this process, the very, very many of them who helped us actually build these initiatives and analyze data and think about our needs. I wanna thank you to Dan Anderson, who was our consultant who did this latter part of the project with us and has helped organize us and keep us on task and frame the task and give us tools and templates and everything else. He would, did a fantastic job and I'm working with him right now on polishing the final documents. Thank you to the Arlington Education Foundation. Without their support, we would not have been able to engage in this effort and involve nearly as many stakeholders as we did. Um, and thank you to the students and families and stakeholders who have provided their input throughout the process. Uh, and thank you to Mr. Thielman, who is pictured there rig um, vigorously advocating for something um, or other <laughs> the welcome center. with his team, the Welcome Center, clearly. Um, <laughs> timeline update is that initial drafts are being um, completed, actually are completed by the planning team and we're doing refinement and revision in preparation for the January 12th meeting of the school committee. And I will be sharing a sample uh, initiative draft with the CIAA subcommittee as well as a little more detail on the initiatives and where they're where we're at with them and getting any feedback on them at the meeting next week we will we're in the process of doing a year-to-year -year cost out that'll be generated for the January 12th meeting um, and can be aligned with at that point uh, our FY 24 budget proposals and the draft plan is to be completed and shared January 12th hopefully with a final plan able to be looked at and approved in late January. A lot of the refinement that's happening right now is around things like being really specific <coughs> about the needs based in the data and our goals in terms of reducing gaps, uh, being really clear about modeling exactly the kind of data 
um, interrogation that we want to see in our school-based plans and department-based plans moving forward, uh, making sure that we're really, we're as specific as we can get about the dollars that are going to be required for each initiative. Um, that's a little tricky as you get into the out years of three, four, five, because we know that some of those initiatives are dependent upon us doing community work to decide what exactly we're gonna do in the next step. So there will be parts of it that are more specific and parts of it that are slightly less specific because it's contingent on community engagement about you know, sort of what happens in some of the out years. Um, but we are uh, working on that timeline and we'll be doing a lot of work over the hall. I will be doing a lot of work with um, Dan and going back and forth with some of the teams uh, over the holiday break to make sure that those are ready for you in the new year. I wanted to give you an overview of the strategic priorities themselves so that you can see the direction we're headed in. Um, one of our goals was to have drafts to the committee for today. I really wanted to make sure that we could have strong drafts for the committee before we brought them to you. So we're still working on them, but I wanted you to have a picture of some of the things we're looking at. Under strategic priority one, there are three initiatives. One focused on instructional vision and coherence. Um, that will be framed around this uh, idea of deeper learning and some of the deeper learning work we've already been doing in the district, defining what we mean by that, um, identifying aspects of strong pedagogical practice as well as curricula that are aligned with ensuring that all students can have immersive experiences, can have highly engaging experiences, and can um, have a strong sense of academic identity and so that they can be challenged in all of their classes. Another one is around student belonging and adult support. Um, and that's really focused on the student experience and supportive relationships with adults and peers. And the third is around implementing MTSS. This came out of our equity audit that we really needed to take a look at our intervention systems, communication systems for intervention, um, and the data that we use to inform intervention. So that's going to be a core initiative under priority one. <coughs> priority two um, has some really exciting initiatives linked to it. One is a pathway to teaching a set of programs that will allow for pathways for future educators inside and outside the district. Um, the goal of this is to increase racial and ethnic representation uh, of the local community within our APS workforce, give students more and different perspectives to serve as role models for them in the classroom. Another is continuing the reimagination of our professional development, making sure that all of our staff are getting effective professional development that's responsive to their needs, that gives them some level of choice and agency in, in determining their path uh, of learning themselves and their growth and development and making sure that we have a professional development strategy that is aligned with our vision and that is expanded to include our paraprofessional and non-instructional staff. Uh, the last one under strategic priority two surrounds competitive compensation and ensuring that we are prioritizing increasing the competitiveness of our compensation across all of our bargaining units and um, all areas of our system so that we can have really competitive candidates as well. Strategic priority three, which is focused on infrastructure, operations, and sustainability, has three um, major initiatives under it. One is inclusive and modern schools, making sure our facilities have effective spaces, technology, um, adequate actual room for us to do the programming that we want to do. The second one is uh, surrounding healthy meals for all. We've expanded our breakfast program in recent years, and we're committed to making sure that we have a lot of options for students and that we're also teaching them about nutrition, um, about sustainability, and about eating in ways that support our environment, support their health, and support their learning. And the third one is focused on facility stewardship and ensuring that our schools are managed proactively, continuously, and that our maintenance, they have enough maintenance and care to provide a safe, healthy, and comfortable student experience that may require additional staffing capacity. It may require us to think really proactively about what kinds of facilities or improvements we want to make over the next five years. So you'll see some pretty concrete things, some of which are already in the capital plan um, linked in that initiative. And finally, strategic priority four is tied to sustaining collaborative partnerships with our community. A uh, major priority there is access to before and after school care services. I will be providing uh, an update on before school care at the next meeting, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but one of the goals of the planning committee was to expand our before and after care options so that our students are able to access varied before and after school care and learning services. I'm thinking about what other learning services or extracurricular options we could give students for after school as well, some of which you heard about tonight from the performing arts team. Um, the second one is tied to this welcome center and registration. We would like to have a centralized location where we can provide stu uh, families with a really effective onboarding experience and enrollment experience to the schools, uh, where we can also uh, hold family workshops, uh, support the development of an LPAC, um, and make sure that we have 
uh, translated documents and resources available and that we are able to uh, connect families with care providers throughout town uh, for services that we may not provide as a public school system but that we can link them to. And finally, the last one under strategic priority four surrounds communication and partnership and making sure that we are improving our communication systems, that those communication systems are two-way and that they are consistent across educators and classrooms, uh, schools, and for the entire district. So that's a lot of initiatives. They are pretty aligned with a lot of the work that we're already doing. Um, we've made a lot of progress actually in many of these in the last year or so. And so hopefully what you'll see in the initiatives that come before you is that we're continuing to build on where our strengths are and identify where our areas for growth are. And I'm looking forward to going through the whole detailed swath of them with you very soon. Happy to take any questions on those in a minute, but I have a couple more updates. Um, first, I wanna highlight some of the work happening in first grade computer science. This is a picture that I got from Dr. McNeil earlier today. Um, of our amazing director of digital learning, Rashmi Pimperkar, working with a group of first grade students uh, with B-Bots, which are little robots that you can program to follow a path. Um, and they can use that to demonstrate their knowledge of like, say, a life cycle, for example, or to tell a story. And we've just introduced these B-Bots to our students at Pacific schools or across all first grade at Dallin. Going around to different schools. Going around to different schools to introduce the B-Bots. Mm -hmm. to, to K-5 students. So just wanted to highlight some of that exciting work happening. We have done two sets of instructional rounds. Um, we've done instructional rounds at the elementary level for the first set and then at the secondary level at OMS and Arlington High School for the second set we've been deeply focused on the instructional task, what students are actually being asked to do, um, and thinking about how that instructional tasks hold students to high standards, what kinds of questions we're asking in the classroom, and it's been a really great experience. We really enjoyed visiting um, OMS. I had some fun in Ms. Key's room with her mm -hmm. students uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, we are going to another deeper learning convening in a couple of months. There is a convening in San Diego in early February, and we are in the process of developing a deeper learning administrative team so that more of that learning can happen across our administrative team. Um, Mr. Dingman is heading up that effort as one of our building leaders and he's working directly with some folks from the Deeper Learning Dozen to facilitate some of that work and we're really looking forward to sort of spreading some of the <coughs> deeper learning concepts that we've been working on uh, to the greater administrative team to start thinking about how they spread that to their departments. Uh, before school care has been going well at Thompson and Pierce. We anticipate that it will continue at Thompson and Pierce through the year. I am in the process of setting up a meet. I don't have a lot of details on this right now because I'm in the process of setting up a meeting with Ms. List, who is our coordinator for that program, to get the details and numbers and breakdown in terms of uh, tuition and how uh, our enrollment has done in that program. But we do want to keep it open. We, if you recall, had reduced the fee for that and wrapped the program into <coughs> the breakfast program sort of part way through, um, and that has improved the enrollment in the before care program slightly. Um, so we'll have, I'll have more of an update on that in the new year, but it will continue at Thompson and Pearson. We're in analyzing whether we can roll it out to more schools this year or whether we want to just do it, finish out the pilot for this year and then make a decision about next year. Um, the APS calendar committee has been meeting and will meet again. We just sent out a survey to families, which I will remind everybody to make sure that they take um, before we leave for the winter break. That, that survey is asking families to tell us what the impact of eliminating a few holidays that we currently have on the calendar, um, not because they're holidays, but because we had concerns about our ability to operate on those days because those holidays could impose a challenge to attendance for teachers and for students. Um, there's Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, and Good Friday. Um, and the, those were off of our calendar where we were off on those days on our calendar because we were concerned about operating. So we're asking families questions about if those days were school days, would you send your child? What would the positive or negative impact be of us being open on those days? And we'll use that feedback to make a, the, for the calendar committee to make a recommendation to me, to make a recommendation to all of you about three years worth of school calendars moving forward. So that'll be coming in January. Um, they are meeting again in January to look over that data and then we'll have a conversation and make some decisions. Uh, the Audison transportation situation has been challenging for a lot of families. That challenge is that a lot of our students in East Darlington are having trouble getting across town uh, to the Audison. 
We are in the process of developing a survey right now that will go out to the Audison community. Um, we're, we're almost to the place where we have the capacity to run a bus from East Arlington to the Audison, and we're gonna try to get that in place at the start of the new year. Um, there will be a fee for this bus. It'll, be, it'll match the MBTA fees. Um, so we're not asking families to pay more than they would otherwise pay to use the MBTA. Um, and we also have, um, I've been working with Representative Garbley on some advocacy to get another 77 route moving on Mass Ave, but unfortunately we just haven't seen that have any fruition to it. So we're hopeful that that will maybe happen, but in the meantime, we're gonna work on our own solution. Um, the deputy superintendent search is off and running. We will have an orientation on um, Monday for the full committee. It's a committee of about 14. Ms. Exton is going to be representative from the school committee on that, com on that initial search committee. The, um, Margaret Creedle Thomas will serve as a process monitor to help us reflect on our process and make sure that we're um, mitigating for bias as much as we can. We're doing a blind review of the um, resumes for our initial search and our first round of interviews will be the first week of January into the second week of January and enrollments are in your materials. Happy to take any questions. Mr. Schlickman. Uh, I just want to note uh, for the record that last week the MBTA announced they were reducing morning service on the 77. Uh, which is totally inexcusable. And I've had conversations with Representative Garvely, too. Um, I mean, we, we're going to have a change in administration in the corner office uh, next month. And uh, Governor-elect Healy has shown that she pays attention to Arlington. Uh, the, uh, the Sunday before the election, she chose Arlington as a place to hold a rally. <coughs> so she knows us. She loves us. And I think we'll probably have a better chance of engaging in the conversation with uh, the executive branch next month than we have now. Uh, that said, I think that at some point we should consider uh, having our representatives in uh, once we get some clarity with, within the new administration and possibly uh, as a committee uh, writing a letter to the governor and to the MBTA regarding our experiences with student transportation and our hopes that they would go back to serving us in, in a reasonable manner. I'm going to chime in on that. Don't have them come here. Have them at the Audison at 830 in the morning and watch these frazzled kids come mm -hmm. running in worried that they're late, worried that they mm -hmm. had a test and they missed part of it. The bus was late. They're freezing cold. Mm -hmm. That's who they need to go talk to. Anybody else? Okay. Um, the next item on our agenda is a review of and possible vote on the current bullying um, intervention and prevention policy. Dr. McNeil had asked us to put this on the agenda. I will explain it okay. first, and then if you want to weigh in, feel free to. Um, essentially, we need to make sure that the up that we update or have eyes on this policy biannually. And right now, the latest prevention and um, implementation plan, the bullying prevention plan, it has the date of 2017 on it, and mm -hmm. we wanna make sure that that has a more current date on it. It's linked to this policy. Mm -hmm. So there aren't any changes to this policy. Our lawyers have reviewed this policy. We just wanna make sure that this mm -hmm. is up to date and that the school committee has said, yes, this is our mm -hmm. bullying policy and it is up to date. And then we are gonna go through and look at the um, intervention and prevention plan and we need to update it because it had some out of date references in it um, and our legal counsel gave us some additional updates this week. So we're gonna go through and make mm -hmm. sure that that intervention plan is also posted to the website with mm -hmm. the new updated date on it so that we are in compliance on our bullying policy and our intervention prevention plan. Mr. Slickman. So basically all we do is vote the policy at this point uh, and it would be uh, the same policy in the same place in the policy manual, except that uh, uh, voted by the Arlington School Committee December 15th, 2022. That's the only thing that's really changing here. We're just putting a date stamp on it. Correct. So I would like to move. Uh, so I assume this is the first read. I move that we suspend the rules uh, to move to second read on this, which requires a two-thirds vote. Second. 
We have a motion by Mr. Schlickman, seconded by Mr. Thielman to suspend the rules for a second read. Uh, discussion? Roll call vote, Mr. Hainer? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. And I vote yes. That's unanimous. We've suspended the rules. Would someone like to make a motion? On second read, I move to, uh, to approve policy JICFB bullying prevention. Second. We have a motion by Mr. Schlickman, seconded by Mr. Hainer to approve policy JICFB. Any discussion? Roll call vote. Mr. Hainer? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Got yes. Got oh, sorry. Dr. Allison Ampey? I was just going to point out to our audience that this is the exact same policy that we already have. There are mm -hmm. no changes. Mm -hmm. Correct. So. Mm -hmm. okay. I'll start again. Mr. Hainer? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. And I vote yes. That's unanimous. Okay. Um, now we have a lot of policies for second read. Um, I, so before we oh, approve them, um, I wrote an amendment as Mr. Thielman asked. Thank you. Um, to, um, so for the public comment, so sorry, so it's policy BEDH-E, guidelines for public com comment. Um, I, perhaps someone will make a motion to amend um, the policy um, where it says, number one, members of the public who wish to address the committee during public comment are advised to register to speak by 6 p.m. on the day of the meeting by telephone or by email directed to the administrative secretary of the school committee. The rest of it stays the same. So after 6 p.m., someone can come to the school committee room um, and sign up on a paper. So. So how do you Mr. Thielman. I'm going to, I'm going to support your uh, okay. amendment. So what's the best way to do this? I guess I'm going to move uh, to amend the original. <clears throat> uh, the first read, the, the, the policy is uh, written in the first reading uh, to the way Dr. Uh, Ms. Exxon just worded it. So it's changing, basically changing the time 6 p.m., yeah. 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. Yeah. Second. On Mr. Thielman's. We have a motion by Mr. Thielman, seconded by Ms. Morgan, to amend policy B E D H E. Mr. Hainer. Can I speak to it? Yep. Okay. Um, I just want to be clear. Does this still, we have a limited amount of people in signing up for time. Would this person, say a person walks in and signs up, would they be at the bottom of the list? Yes. I haven't changed anything to this except Fine. that the time at which. Thank you. Dr. Allison Ampey. Thank you. Um, I appreciate what you're trying to do with this, but I am concerned that six o'clock is a difficult time for our staff. I mean, that, that that's, they have to get prepared for the meeting and stuff too, including things like eating and you know, getting the school committee room ready and stuff. And I'm just concerned that that's close enough to, we're not allowing them enough time for preparing <coughs> for the meeting itself. And so I'm questioning whether six o'clock is too late. And so right now I'm not gonna support this, but um, that's, anyway, that's me. Mr. Hainer. Prior to the pandemic, people could come in as, as they could come in as late as 6:30 and sign up. So when we moved it back, this uh, suggestion it's, is moving. No, it back I really, back. I'm taking. Miss Morgan made a suggestion to have it be 6:25. I agree right. that the administration is getting, administrative staff is getting ready for this yeah. meeting, and so six o'clock felt like a time late enough to make me feel comfortable about people who cannot physically get here while giving the administrative staff time to prepare for this meeting. So that's how I landed on 6 o'clock. Yes, people can walk in here and sign up at 6.30. Mm -hmm. That part has not changed. Any more discussion? Mr. Schlickman. I'm also inclined to vote no on the 
uh, on the amendment as I do share the concern about the, I, I, I watch what Ms. Diggins is doing uh, in the hour before the meeting and it's very intense. Her work day ends at four. I don't think that uh, extending this beyond uh, an hour before her cutoff for a work day is a reasonable thing to do. She works from 10 to six on Thursdays. The, you know, I just want I just want to say, you know, this is coming from the chair who's been running this committee for the past year and working with all the staff. So I, I trust this plan, and I think it's a good one, and I urge the committee to support it. More? All right. We have a motion by Mr. Thielman, seconded by Ms. Morgan, to amend the policy to 6 p.m. Uh, roll call vote. Mr. Can I just say? We're amending the policy that we haven't voted on yet. Correct. The proposed, <laughs> yes. the, the, the right? proposed yes. policy. The proposed, yes. thank okay. you. Yes. Th yes, sorry, proposed okay. policy, yes. Yeah. And the only thing that changed is that we're going from three to six. Correct. Okay. Mr. Hainer. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. No. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey. No. And I vote yes. The motion passes one, two, three, four, five to two. Okay. okay. So I think we'll vote this policy separately since mm -hmm. the time has been changed. Mm -hmm. um, so let's start with that one because we're discussing it and then we'll, I think we can do the, whole, the rest of the. Can we do all the rest in one vote? Yeah. Because it's a second. Yeah. So I, I yeah. move that we adopt uh, by, we adopt all of the, um, all of the policies that were uh, uh, first reads at our last meeting with the exception of this one, BED. Well, why don't we dispose of this one first? Yeah, so why don't yeah. we move? Okay. I move approval of BEDH-E as amended. Second. Okay. We have a motion by Mr. Schlickman, seconded by Mr. Thielman to approve policy BEDH-E as amended. Any discussion? Roll call vote. Mr. Hainer. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. And I vote yes. That's unanimous. So I think we can do the rest as a. I have a, I have, I have a request to withhold ECEV. Okay. Okay. Uh, why don't we take ECEV then? Okay. So policy ECEV. Mr. Hunter, do you want to say something before? No, I appreciate, I appreciate the intent of the policy. I think it's just a little bit too prescriptive for a school committee policy. I mean, I just like the bikes that are attached to the benches, beautiful benches that we have out front, but I'm not going to propose a policy that we can't have bikes attached to those benches. So I'm not going to support it, but I understand the, I appreciate the intent. Thanks. Someone like to make a motion? To I move approval of uh, policy ECEV, electric vehicle charging stations. Second. We have a motion by Mr. Schlickman, seconded by Mr. Hainer, to approve policy EC-V for electric vehicles. Any discussion? Mr. Thielman? Was there any conversation within the school <coughs> uh, leadership about this, Dr. Holman? And what's their feeling? Yes, um, we, I've discussed it. We've discussed it in policy subcommittee. It's, ch ch I mean, we won't be the enforcers of this policy. It would need to fall to town's folks. We can put the signs up and make sure that we encourage people only to use those charging stations when they are actively charging. We've already informed staff that that is the expectation and we've seen some improvement over the last couple of weeks. Um, but our ability to manage parking during the school day is simply not possible. Not, not possible. So we are reliant on the clause in the policy that says that we will be co needing to collaborate with APD and parking enforcement in town to oversee the monitoring of this policy. But you, you support the policy or the, your team does or you, what do you? I, I do in so far as I think our staff should have access to charge their vehicles when they're at school. Yeah. One thing that's notable though is we're going to tell staff you're not expected to move your car once you're done charging. You need mm -hmm. to plug it in at the start of the day mm -hmm. and use the spot to charge your vehicle uh, but we're not going to expect staff to move their cars once it's mm -hmm. full. Dr. Allison Ampey. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to point out, this is a little different than people parking their, I mean, locking their bikes to the benches in that if we're truly trying to electrify our vehicles, people have to be able to charge. And if someone is parked and not using the charger and say is a gas 
car not using the charger, then they're blocking the ability of someone else to use it. And that's different than just making an eyesore or, or, or something. Um, so <coughs> even if this seems a little prescriptive, it is in line with our desire to move things to decrease our, our CO2 emissions and uh, move to an electrical vehicle future. So, thank you. Ms. Morgan. I, put, I, have a, I, don't, I, I wasn't on the policy. So this doesn't fall under like town rules about electrical vehicles. Like we don't fall under that because it's our property. It's ours. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and in fact, the ta deputy town manager uh, is very encouraged by our work on this. He, and he will be taking our policy to the select board and look to amend the traffic rules and orders of the town to align with what we're doing. Okay. We have a motion by Mr. Slickman, seconded by Mr. Hayner, I think. Um, to approve policy EC-V for electric vehicles. Any more discussion? Okay, Mr. Hayner. Yes. Mr. Cardin. No. Nope. Ms. Morgan. Yes. Mr. Slickman. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. And I vote yes. That's six in favor and one opposed. Um, okay, N now I think we can take the rest. Is there any, anyone else have any other policy they want to <laughs> I talk take about? <laughs> no, okay. So we, did B E D so I move a, approval of J F B B B E D H dash E J I C A. We did B E D H. Okay, okay, that they're, they're, it's listed twice in, in the file here. J I C A, file A C, file J B, file G B A, file G C F, file A C dash R, file J I C, and file B E D B. Can I get a second? Second. A motion by Mr. Schlickman, seconded by Mr. Cardin. Any discussion? Roll call vote. Mr. Hayner? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. And I vote yes. That's unanimous. Okay. Um, so next we have a first read of um, proposed school committee meeting dates for the next three years. Um, with the goal um, that the superintendent would like to prepare school calendars for the next three years. Um, Mr. Schlickman was kind enough to propose dates following the schedule that we've been um, using for the last few years. Um, I did make two administrative changes to in June, the lab graduations typically happen on the second Thursday in June, and Dr. Holman had asked if we could avoid those so that committee members and the um, superintendent could attend if wanted. So I moved a meeting earlier. We, we can change that, but I just moved them off of that um, date. I have this as a first read. We can discuss it now and vote it next time. Um, committee comments? Dr. Allison Ampey. Thanks. Um, just for September 23, when does school start? Is it, is it before the 7th? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay, then I have no problem with that. Tuesday the 5th would be my, which year? 2023. probably yes yeah. anything else mr. Slickman yeah I mean this follows the old pattern we have made adjustments uh, uh, when we've seen uh, conflicts approach this also assumes that we want to maintain a Thursday schedule any thoughts on that right now I think it's great. okay all right I will bring this back to the January 12th meeting we can approve it so that we can share it with Ms. Higgins <coughs> and Dr. Homan. Consent agenda. All items right up there. 
All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There'll be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Warrant number 23103 in the amount of $507,432.77, dated December 13th, 2022. So moved. Second. Motion by Mr. Hainer, seconded by Mr. Schlickman. Roll call vote. Mr. Hainer? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. And I vote yes. That's unanimous. Subcommittee liaison reports and announcements. Budget. Dr. Allison Ampey? Thank you. Um, we met on the 9th. We hope to meet again next week and then in early January. On the 9th, we reviewed uh, some committee questions about the end of your report and we heard an update on the FY23 budget. We heard about the FY24 budget. As uh, Ms. Morgan mentioned, we saw a much rough draft, rougher draft of what you saw tonight. And we discussed the little that was known about the long range plan. And uh, then we're hoping to see, talk again next week. Thank you. Community relations, Mr. Hainer. Nothing to report. Curriculum, instruction, assessment, and accountability, Ms. Morgan. We're meeting next Wednesday to talk about AHS and the strategic plan. Facilities, Mr. Thielman. We met on Monday the 12th at 8.30 a.m. Ms. Keyes was there. We had a good discussion. Uh, Mr. Behrens, the uh, new facilities director of the town of Arlington was there. Mr. Mason was there. Dr. Holman was there. Dr. Allison Ampey and Ms. Morgan were there. And so we had a good discussion about Dallin, uh, Otteson, AHS, Parmenter, maybe Pierce a little bit, I think. I don't know. Um, and, mice. Huh? and mice. And mice. We talked about mice and rats. And so um, we were doing so well, Jane. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, anyway, good discussion. Uh, you know, there are heating and ventilation issues that are being addressed by the dish, by the town. And um, we learned a lot about leakage that happens in the old uh, high school due to that, that takes a while to isolate where the leaks are in the system and, and what and to repair them. Um, so I mean, we surfaced the problems we identified, we talked about them, we had the person in the room who has to uh, uh, solve them and it was a good discussion. I don't know, am I missing anything? Yeah. No, but I would just update that some improvements have definitely been made because some of our offices on the sixth floor are less boiling than they oh. were. So yeah. I know like some of the actions that Mr. Barrett described are, they are definitely doing and is definitely helping. Well, and Jane I mean, insisted and so that was it. And can I just say very appreciative staff across the district. They feel heard, they feel listened to, and they're really appreciating having a plan going forward to address the problems. Yeah, and it was a good session. It was also good to have the, keep the ciders in the room. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And the advocates, mm -hmm. all of us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Policy and procedures, Mr. Slickman. Uh, I think we've, we've done <laughs> enough. We're, we're looking for uh, possible policy changes from budget and curriculum. Uh, Arlington High School Building Committee, Mr. Thielman. We meet on January 3rd, and that's all there is to it, right? We're not even going to pull the committee. We're meeting on Tuesday, January 3rd. That's not sure. <laughs> yes. I'm know, not sure. Been, I will not be there. I know there's been a whole email exchange about this. I lost track of it. It's, we're meeting on, on the first Tuesday in January. Hopefully with yeah. a quorum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hopefully with a quorum. Things are moving along great. They are, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Superintendent evaluation, Mr. Cardin. Nothing. Thanks. Liaison report. Announcements? Mr. Hainer? Um, I had the privilege of inviting Dr. McNeil to the Rotary meeting uh, yesterday, and he talked about uh, the new literacy program. There were three educators in the room, including Dr. Uh, McNeil. He got across the program that is being presented, excited the group uh, greatly. They asked me to come and share with the full committee. What a great job he did. And, uh, Several of them said, we're very fortunate to have them. I said, for the next six months, they were very upset over that part of it. Mm -hmm. So thank you again, Dr. McNeil. Awesome job. And, and I appreciate the invitation. I enjoyed myself immensely. Thank you for having me. Mr. Uh, I just want to share that um, the superintendent invited me uh, to accompany her on instructional rounds, and it was a wonderful experience. 
not only did I get an insight into how the superintendent is looking at teaching and learning instruction, and, and she's really sharp and right on, but we saw some great things going on in the classroom. And I was in Miss Key's classroom too, and it was fun. Let me tell you, she's got, she had her kids doing an exercise in which they created their own fictitious country. And then the decision was, okay, here's these other countries in the world. Do you want to trade with them? And so that there was a depth of thinking on what normally would have been a, a, a very road exercise. And, uh, and I had a lot of fun with this, this one girl who named her country Chicken Wings. <laughs> it, 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 was, it was great. It was a lot of fun. And the instructional support I saw, I mean, there was really a lot of good scaffolding and support for kids. I, I saw a lot of good things happening with, uh, uh, with inclusion just... Uh, in passing, a lot of really nice things happening in the Odyssey. Um, and, you know, we, we could take a look at the test scores from this year, which were really sharp, but you could see really good teaching and really good climate. Thank you. Bill? Okay. Future agenda items? Ms. Morgan? I almost emailed you about this. Um, are we going to get an athletics report at some point, like where the AD comes? Yes. I'm not sure if it was on our list. It's not on our list, but we... Is it something we could... That you could consider I will doing? Yeah. We have had one in the past, but it's been a minute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion by Mr. Thielen, seconded by Mr. Hainer. Roll call vote. Mr. Hainer? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Slickman? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. And I vote yes. That's unanimous. The meeting is adjourned.